Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here. Now, if you need cash without the controversy, the team at SaveWithConrad.com can help. But don't take my word for it. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Munson. I'm from West Roxbury, Massachusetts. While listening in the car one day with my wife, we both were like, oh, she, he does mortgages. Let's, we should look into this. We've tried to refinance a couple of times and either the, the process was too crazy or we were told we didn't have enough equity in the house yet, even after owning it for about 15 years at that point you guys started servicing Massachusetts and we just jumped all over it, reached out through the website and Larry actually gave us a buzz and started walking us through the process. And it was just, it was just wonderful. It was a great experience. So we managed to consolidate a lot of debt and also take some money out. And we were still at or below what the value of the house was borrowing in 2005 when we bought the house. Hi, my name is Jeffrey Munson. My wife and I managed to save $1,800 a month and are now paying $400 less each month with SaveWithConrad.com. And unlike the dirt sheets, these reviews don't lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out SaveWithConrad.com and do it today. You'll be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR, the voice of professional wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? Pretty good, Connie. Been busy. Had a busy week here thus far. Uh, getting excited about the weekend. Uh, we'll be doing collision in, uh, where will we be? Uh, Lexington, Kentucky. I think so. And then the next morning at 5. AM on Sunday, I'm flying to New Jersey to do a, uh, autograph appearance right there is a good old, look at that information. If you're watching it on, on YouTube, you see it right there. That's where we're going to be Sunday, uh, double tree by Hilton Fairfield hotel and suites, uh, in Fairfield, New Jersey. And I think I go, I think I start about 11, 11 AM. So, uh, after flying from Lexington to Charlotte, Charlotte to Newark, and then land by land to the, to the appearance. So it's going to be an aggressive uh, Sunday, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. It's a market. I haven't been in a long time and hopefully the folks will turn out and enjoy what we're doing and, uh, and come say hello. So it's going to do signing autographs and you know, the normal stuff you do at a, at a fan convention type thing. So I'm doing that on Sunday. So that's a part of the weekend. And this week I had a busy week. Uh, that's, an, that's I sound like a broken record. Uh, but we had Tuesday. I went to my wound doctor appointment, which was the shits, uh, hurt like hell. And what he does, he takes a scaffold, gets open that wound and he, he cuts off all the bad tissue mm. with uh, lidocaine. That's the only, my doctor's really weird. You know, I, I want, I want heavy duty meds and I'm not getting it. So, <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm gritting my teeth like John Wayne would with a stick in his mouth, pulling that arrow out of his shoulder. You know, how many times John Wayne got shot in the shoulder is a million. <laughs> yeah. Cause he could heal from that and shoot his gun. Uh, so, um, I'm doing that and, uh, I did that and then I had my MRI on Tuesday afternoon. I should get the results back in three to five days. I'm told, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that the tibia bone, the ankle bone has not been compromised by any of the radiation treatments or the skin cancer or anything along those lines. I'm fingers crossed on that deal. Cause the, uh, the options, Connie are, you know, they got to go in there and if the bone has been compromised, they have to go in there and remove the, the that effective place. And that's going to put me on the shelf for a while. So hopefully this information on the, uh, MRI is going to be favorable to our side. So I did that. Then I went to Daly's place. Ironic. I've been in Daly's place in months and months. And after being there for every week for seemingly forever during the COVID piece of business. And, uh, we filmed the, uh, interview with Kenny Omega which I thoroughly enjoyed. I love doing these set down interviews. Uh, it was just, uh, it just, they're just so refreshing. It's something different. 
and and we don't have a script you know we didn't have a we had an outline of things that we wanted to address uh so that was really cool but then of course the the obligatory bad guys made their presence felt on the empty stage there at dailies and all hell broke loose so uh as some of the seen it can respond uh to it but it was a real good piece of business i was very pleased to be a part of it and i think the fans are going to thoroughly enjoy it uh, unless you don't like seeing kenny omega get the shit beat out of him and that's exactly what happened it was it's, it's uh, so i don't want to for those that haven't seen it i don't want to spoil the surprise but it's worth going out of your way to make sure you see it uh, because it was really compelling to say the very least so I've had a busy week flying to Lexington, Kentucky on uh, Friday. Get there a little early. Last week was a photo finish. Man. I, I walked into the arena last week and I had, Connie, I had maybe 10 minutes before uh, the, the main event, which I called. And man, that was a sweaty, you know, my driver was late. I had to drive to Charlotte to Greensboro. Uh, I've done that drive a zillion times, but it never seemed like it was that long because I was so, and so stressed, but, uh, it, it came off good. That was a good six man tag. And, uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. So all good, all good. So it's, uh, it's worked out pretty good. I had a good, have had a busy week and now we're here and, uh, we got a good show to talk about. A great show to talk about. And of course, there's still your chance to see Jr. live this weekend. Collision is on the road and Jr. is back where he belongs behind the microphone this time at the Rupp arena. And he's also going to be making a trip across the pond as folks are listening to this. We're just 10 days away from all in. I can't believe that's a real thing. And you guys, uh, just a few days ago passed more than 80,000 tickets sold it's amazing. now at this point. Beat not only SummerSlam 92, not only WrestleMania 3, but we are just a few tickets away. And by the time folks are listening to this, maybe we've passed it, which would be the 80,709 record from WrestleMania 32 in Texas. Wow. This is getting crazy, man. And it's a, <laughs> a really unique and special show in that, you know, usually when you have these big monster shows, you know, the full card well in advance. Most of these tickets were sold before we ever announced a single match. All right. This is going to be a special night for AEW, is it not? Oh yeah. Of course. History making. And, uh, you know, can th th here's the thing. Some people are already talking, can they replicate it? You know, I ain't worried about replicating it. I'm worried yeah. about how we're going to, you know, we got to get there. Uh, they got to get all set up. We got to, we got to be ready to rock and roll, uh, with a crowd that big. And hopefully entertain the hell out of them. And I think we will, uh, the card, the card's not bad, not bad at all. Uh, and more matches are going to be added to Wembley, uh, within the next, I'd say, you know, this week at some right. point. So consequently, it's pretty good. Uh, it's going to be good. I'm excited about going over there. I've been over to England so many times to do wrestling. Uh, and I'm excited about. You know, in my stage of life, Connor, you got to be realistic. One has to be realistic. How many more England trips do I have in me? I don't know. Oh, well. Well. I hope to say a lot, but I don't know how often we're, you know, you're not going to be able to play Wembley again for a while. Right. I don't see it. I don't, uh, it may be some people say, well, why don't you do it every year? I don't know that you can. Right. I guess you can. Certainly you can, but I think, uh, letting it, having the event, let the people, let it absorb it, enjoy it, talk about it, relive it, all those things, uh, I think will be, uh, will indicate what we're going to do going forward. But I, all I'm worried about is, uh, getting to Lexington, <laughs> getting to New Jersey for my appearance. So you just basically what I'm saying I'm taking it a day at a time because that's the most sane way of doing it. It's going to be a busy time, man. And we got star cast. I'm looking forward to that. So I'm, yeah, Jim, uh, I don't know that me and you've talked about that, but <laughs> this is maybe the first time in history, something like this has happened. I mean, I guess we'd have to go all the way back to like survivor series, 1991. And then the whole Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view that was a different time, a different place. 
but we're going to have the biggest AEW show in history and all in. And then we're going to have the traditional Labor Day weekend pay-per-view all out one week later in Chicago. Yeah. And of course, I know you and I are excited to be there because we've got StarCast that's going to be happening. And man, it's just one panel after another. Tony Khan is going to be on stage for the very first time uh, at StarCast, which is super exciting to think about. And not only that, we've got other stars we've never had before, like Dennis Rodman and Kawada. My goodness, if you grew up watching tapes and you were a tape trader in the 90s, you know all about what he was doing in all Japan with Masawa and Kobashi and so many of these legends. Kawada has not been to the United States in over 35 years. Uh, He's never like, done a fan convention or anything of this sort ever in his life. He's not only going to be there to take your pictures and sign your autographs and just shake this legend's hand. But in addition to that, he'll be on stage with Eddie Kingston, right? And Eddie Kingston wrestles in black and yellow as a tribute to Kawada. This is his wrestling hero. We will have a translator there, but you're going to hear his story for the first time. And this is all available at Starcast. And we don't usually do mail-ins. We're making an exception uh, for this particular event because we have so many unique opportunities. So if you can't make it to Chicago, you can still get your autographs. Heck yeah. R-R-C-A-S-T dot com. And if you can't make it to Chicago, what better way to join in on the action than watch it on Premiere? Because by the way, when you watch it on Premiere, not only do you get StarCast 6, you get StarCast 1 through 5, all included in that price. And how about two weeks of premiere or two months rather of premiere plus as well. It's an incredible value. You can be there in spirit. You can watch right. these shows live or on demand over at starcast on premiere.com. That's starcast on premiere.com. It's a great time to be a wrestling fan, Jim. There's so in much cool stuff going on, man. Yeah. It's a chance to meet a lot of people that you haven't met, um, uh, pretty much the entire AEW roster. You know, there may be an exception here or there, you know, but not many. Most of the guys are going to be a part of this thing and looking forward to it. Uh, so as am I, so it's going to, should be a lot of fun. And, and, uh, you know, Conrad and his team, oh, wait, by the way, they have the special booth for bulls mustache. Uh, so you can draw with a magic marker that won't wash off a of mustache. I allow the Silva family. My goodness. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So, uh, <laughs> I, every time I see on Facebook, Bulls kids, I it warms my heart because they're so cute. And then there's that little mustache kind of hanging out. The best. Oh yeah, man. He's something else. <laughs> it looks like Peter Lorre's mustache, and people are going to say, "Who the hell is Peter Lorre?" Well, Google the damn thing. You'll see, and you'll see that little mustache. Yeah, you will. So anyhow, it's all good though. So it's, a lot of great things are coming up. Hope you guys are able to participate any way you can. Conrad just outlined. You don't even have to leave your house. You can join, you can join us on premiere, right? Conrad is called That's premiere. exactly right. If you're, if you're able to make it, you should, we've got lots of surprises up our sleeves. I worked on something last night. I couldn't believe we were creating, uh, we've yet to announce it. Stay tuned, but, uh, it's going to be something everybody's talking about. It's starcast six in Chicago, S T A R R C A S T.com. And, uh, you can pick up a bracelet, by the way, let me explain what that does. It gets you access to all events. We'll have not one, but two stages. Uh, just one live panel after another fun, interactive stuff, hearing from people you've never heard from before you get access to all those panels on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you got your pick at two stages. And then of course, in between man, go meet some of your favorite legends. Go get some of your favorite autographs and photos and get your belt signed and Jim Ross amongst them. We're all going <laughs> to be there. com is where you make it happen. And if you can't get to Chicago, no problem, daddy. It's starcast on premiere.com. But Jim, our topic today is an exciting one because people just can't get enough of the attitude era. And I think we could argue at the time, 1998, man, the WWE had never been hotter. They'd never been more profitable. We've been in a dog fight for a few years in the Monday night wars. We got our ass kicked 83 weeks in a row. I heard that. Thanks to the magic of stone cold, Steve Austin and Mr. McMahon, all of those tides started to change in April. And by the summer, man, things are really heating up on the other channel. Goldberg streak is alive and well, he's just beaten Hulk Hogan for the world title at the Georgia dome. They've also recently involved Dennis Rodman and Carl Malone. Things are hot, hot, hot on that program. 
but seemingly even hotter here. And we try something that the WWE is only tried a handful of times, a baby face main event. It's all about stone cold and the undertaker and where else should it take place, but Madison square garden. So we're going to talk about that today, but man, when you think back to 1998 and you're seeing not only what you guys are doing, but you know what WCW is doing with the, the NBA opportunity. I mean, you guys are fresh off of using Mike Tyson right? and Dennis Rodman and Carl Malone both played forward and both played against each other in the finals. And then just a month later, they're wrestling like this. The timing for WCW on that deal was really incredible. What'd you think of the way they did the, the whole NBA piece of business in WCW? Well, I think that it, uh, got them a lot of publicity. Yeah. And they got people talking. And I think that was the main thing because you're not going to go into that with those two NBA greats, uh, and say, boy, they're going to have a great match. I've seen their matches. They're really good. Well, no, you hadn't. That's what, and that was part of the charm, the unknown the surprise element. So uh, I think what the biggest advantage for that whole thing was the, the, uh, massive PR that it garnered in various outlets that heretofore would normally not have mentioned uh, a pro wrestling event. So that's for my thoughts on that deal. I wasn't expecting a, a Meltzer five-star classic, but I was curious as to how they're going to pull it off. And, uh, so it, it was a good promotional idea. That was a good idea. Whoever came up, Eric or whomever, uh, it was a good idea because it got the publicity that they were looking for. Uh, so. I don't think they booked the damn thing to have a great match. I don't, I just don't, you know, you have some good workers in there You pay DDP would keep the rudder in the water on his side. Hogan would keep the rudder in the water on his side. So you got two great veterans that knew where not to go. Yes. And, and you know, and so that's kind of how I looked at it. Malone looks like a, he's shredded. Yeah. You know, he's it's shredded. crazy. I mean, these guys are legit superstar athletes. And they're wrestling. They're not just there in a, in a, in an enforcer capacity or outside right. the ring. They're stepping through the ropes. They're doing their best to wrestle. As you said, nobody necessarily expects a five-star Matt classic, but man, every media outlet in the world is there. All eyes are on WCW. So now the, the pressure's on, how does the WWF respond? Well, how do they respond by selling out every freaking where they go? Uh, the pond in Anaheim set an all-time record for Southern California. That wasn't a WrestleMania gate. It's a sellout over 12,000 paying fans over $285,000 at the gate. It creatively, boy, it sure is a fun show. Owen Hart's going to come out and issue an open challenge to anyone in the building. And here comes Jason sensation dressed up just like Owen Hart <laughs> Boy, really getting at him, getting the fans to start chanting nugget at it, nailing the Owen impression. This is fun, fun and silly stuff. Yeah. Uh, that, Jason sensation is a very talented kid. Uh, you know, he had a. He had a short, albeit uh, productive run, as they say, uh, but his uh, impersonations were excellent. So uh, he added a lot to that whole presentation, and I wish his career had lasted longer for his sake, uh, but he, he will always be remembered for his contributions, especially there in 98. Of course, Dan Severin steps in and saves Jason from a big beatdown. That leads to Dan versus Owen. Ken Shamrock gets involved, so we're trying to get Dan involved. And as you see, if you're watching along with us, he's doing his business here dressed like he's also ready to sell you some term life insurance. <laughs> uh, then we've got, uh, an, another piece of crazy business here. I can't believe this is real, but this is the same episode where we do the Val Venus taking a shower with Yamaguchi son's wife. Eventually there's a uh, hell to pay. They're saying that they're going to, uh, have a big surprise for him and he chops a sausage in half and Val of course is worried and Yamaguchi, this is real. This was said on TV, choppy, choppy, your PP. <laughs> and, uh, Jerry it, was Lawless, it, it was different. I can tell you that it was different. You uh, think y'all would have done a choppy, choppy PP angle with the cowboy? Would that have been something up for? No, now? I don't, I don't think it'd been high on his list of priorities. Yeah. If Ernie had Ernie lad had presented that, I'm sure cowboy would have had a they would have had a cussing match. Ernie wouldn't have cussed, but Cowboy would. Uh, no, hell no. It's just, it's too risque. 
but that was what we were shooting for. I mean, that was the whole deal is, you know, whether you like it philosophically or not, you know, it wasn't my favorite thing, but it wasn't, I just, I had fun just kind of following along because it was new and it was different. We've talked about that. Wrestling fans love new. They love different. And that damn sure filled that bill. Let's just recap where we are so far. We've had the, the really great, uh, Owen Hart, Jason sensation skit. Then we had the choppy, choppy PP segment. And then the very next segment comma comes out and now he has <clears throat> donned a pimp roll and he has three hoes. This is the first time we see the Godfather. Of course, we most recently saw him doing the brawl for all. And the idea here is that Hawk is stoned out of his mind. He's tripping all over himself, falling asleep. Uh, we're doing some crazy angles here. And as if that's not enough, we keep it going in the next segment where Sable comes out. They're addressing who won and who lost the whole fully loaded bikini contest. She is protesting that, you know, she was screwed and this wasn't fair. And Mr. McMahon doesn't want her to take her clothes off and. She just rips it off and man, she's running around in a very uh, revealing bikini and high heels. We've just got one big segment after another. I know this is very much the crash TV era, but there's a lot of entertaining and although I'll admit different wrestling content. I mean, All bikini right, contests and chippy, chopping peepees and, uh, and, and, and parodies of, of Owen Hart and you know, the Godfather and drunk wrestlers. We're trying a lot of new stuff, but if nothing else, it's keeping people from changing the channel. Right, Jim? Yeah, pretty much. That was a goal. I think that was Vince Russo was writing TV then, right? Yes. So, you know, he reached it into his bag of tricks and, uh, pulled out some of these, uh, segments where, you know, his goal was, and I don't disagree with his goal whatsoever, that every segment should have a, a beginning, a middle and an end. If the end is to continue it, then that's the end. Uh, but certainly, uh, it was, there was a reason in Russo's mind for all those segments. Now, some people still dislike them and all that stuff, even to this day. Uh, but you know, we were in a, we were in a battle and we had to counteract, uh, the deep pockets of uh, billionaire Ted. So it was, uh, whether we liked it creatively or did not. Uh, it seemed to fill its purpose of keeping people tuned in because the show was successful in that respect. It was it a cr cr critically acclaimed, maybe not, but it was certainly unique and different. Well, what else is unique and different is this is also the time that we record our very first Sunday night heat. It's such an interesting time for the company. I mean, the introduction of choppy, choppy PP and Jason sensation and the Godfather character. And oh, by the way, it's also the first Sunday night heat. As I understand it, it's not only you on the headsets, but you're there with a very young Shane McMahon. What do you think of Shane, Shane's uh, first foray into commentary here with you? Decaf. He needed a decaf. <laughs> oh, he's a good kid. Yeah, he's tried hard, always trying to make his dad proud, which is not a bad thing. And then we had all the the ladies. It seemed to be. Owen Shane's side of the desk. Oh, JR there in that stupid ass black hat. <laughs> so it's all good. It was, it was, it was, uh, interesting. Uh, you know, he, that's a hard job to yeah. not have any experience and be thrown into the deep water. And, uh, I'd say he, he came through it. Okay. I mean, you know, we weren't expecting greatness because he had not done it before. We didn't know what to expect. So it was as big a surprise for those of us that were working with Shane and involved in the production as it was for, uh, the fans at home. Cause we weren't sure what was, how this was going to play out. So, but it was, you know, I, I always had time for Shane. He, he was, a, he was good to me and polite, uh, was never disrespectful. Not one time, you know, every now and then he'd want to know why I signed this guy or that guy, what do you see in this guy, whatever. But I had no problem with that. If I didn't have a reason. Uh, then he's got me, but I always had a reason. I always had a plan that here's what this guy could do. You know, Godfather, for example, we knew the Godfather would, was going to be a, uh, reliable guy. Yeah. Charles Wright's a good dude and he'd earned his opportunity and he made that character. He took it to himself and made it his own 
And anytime a talent can do that, uh, whether they really like the creative or they don't is irrelevant. You, you gotta like it, figure a way to like it and make it better and make it yours. And Charles Wright, uh, AKA the Godfather did that in, in, in spades. He was, he was brilliant. He was, he knew how to be a, uh, he knew how to be a, a, a pimp, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. He was good at it though. And I, and I love Charles, Charles, good dude. Charles is my domino playing buddy. When I go to Vegas, we get in the back room at his club and shake the bones. So, uh, and I, I have so much fun doing that. It reminds me back to my, you know, I used to own a pool hall in Westfield, Oklahoma back in I didn't the day. know that. No, yeah. I didn't know that. It was right next door to my department store. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, anyhow, uh, I'm a domino freak. I enjoy playing dominoes. That's what we ought to have Conrad sometimes uh, at Starcast. A domino match between JR and somebody. You know what? On. We might do that on stage. Hell, I don't know. Hey, let's talk about uh, real quick this Sunday Night Heat debut because let's okay. remember this is before SmackDown. So, yes, we have our syndicated shows on the weekend. We've got superstars and things like that, but it's all about Monday nights. And so, when WWE announces they're doing a Sunday show, it's a big opportunity. So, of course, we want JR on the headsets. The decision is made to try Shane there. Meltzer would say he felt a little forced where he was trying to use some of his dad's style, but also use the hip terminology of the day. And, and maybe he was being a little repetitive and he couldn't really decide what his character was. Right. Is he the rich kid who was just given this job by his evil dad? But he's also openly rooting for the baby faces. So Meltzer says, Hey man, it's his first effort. He's got to figure out what it is, but the fans figured out what it was. Check this out. The first Sunday night heat at 7 PM on a Sunday night does a 3.67 rating and a 7.65 share. Those would be astronomical numbers these days. Of course, people consume media differently now and blah, blah, blah. But man, this first Sunday night heat, I know eventually Sunday night heat was no longer a priority. It fell way down the totem pole. But this first one, my goodness, what a rating for a Sunday night. Yes. Uh, pleasantly surprised by, by that. No doubt. It was uh, pretty cool. And like I said, uh, Shane was thrown into the deep water right away. And that's Vince's style, you know, and he, he, he Vince counted on Jr. to make sure that we kept the rudder in the water, that we stayed in our lane and that I helped Shane as best I could. And one of the key things about when you work with a new guy is, uh, and I've talked to, uh, you know, my partners on collision, uh, about this is that we all have to listen to each other. Yes. And that's not meant to be sound, uh, you know, overbearing or whatever, but to, to connect the dots, you have to retain what was just said. So you can go from point A to point B in a logical way. So that was what I, that's one of the things I told Shane just without this sounding cyn cynical or sinister or anything along those lines, just listen to me because I'm going to give you the ball. Mm -hmm. And you, if you're listening, when I pass the ball to you, you're going to know exactly where you're going. And so, uh, but he was, he was cooperative in that regard. He wanted to do well. You know, Shane always wanted to imp impress his dad, like most fathers and sons, you know, it's like my favorite time of the year is little league world series. You know, hell I'm excited about that. Cause I see moms and dads in the stands living their kid's dream. I think yeah. that's the coolest thing in the world. And before I, hopefully before I'm knocking on wood while I'm still around, I want to go to the, to Williamsport. I want to go to Williamsport. I want to enjoy that experience. I've seen those kids, uh, like I said, living their dream. I don't know. I, I played a little league baseball. I wasn't on that level whatsoever, but uh, we had a good little league team. It was a great, they were great memories. My mom and dad would come to the games. I'd get coached again when I got home. You know, so you, you, you mean, you can't tell me when you know, he's going to throw a curve, right? Top deal. So dad was always happy to help me. <laughs> so anyhow, it, it's just a, a unique opportunity. So I don't know how I got sidetracked on. I'm sorry. Hey man, you and I are big ball fans. And, and so anytime we get a chance to talk about that, that's exciting. Speaking of that. Attention fantasy football fanatics as draft season approaches. Don't neglect the most important draft pick of all your game balls. 
We all know how injuries can ruin a season. So let Manscaped take care of that Reggie Bush of yours with their skin safe technology. This should guarantee you have a smooth ride into the playoffs. The leaders in below the waist grooming have created a championship lineup with their performance package 4.0. And it's time for you to do the same. Join the 9 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped to get ready for kickoff by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping. When you use our code, Jim Ross, now inside the performance package 4.0, you'll find the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, the weed whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, the crop preserver ball, deodorant, the crop reviver toner, the performance boxer briefs and a travel bag slide at a quarterback. You have the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. This spaceship is here to guide you on a journey to trim your body, your balls, and even your <clears throat> a gap. This generation of the trimmer, this is the fourth one still has that cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce those grooming accidents. Thanks to that proprietary skin safe technology. The lawnmower 4.0 has a 7,000 RPM motor, and it's even got a new travel lock. By the way, it's waterproof and it has a 4,000 K led spotlight. That's brighter than Bryce Young's future in the end zone. Also inside this performance package 4.0 is the weed whacker. And that thing, man, it runs through your ear and nose hairs like Aaron Donald through your favorite quarterback. It's got a 9,000 RPM motor and it's a 360 degree rotary dual blade system. Once again, you can enjoy this proprietary skin safe technology on all of it. They help reduce nicks and snags and tugs. And did I mention the crop preserver ball deodorant and the crop reviver to help those bench warmers, buddy, this is the game changer of all the shed travel bag. JR to this day still uses it. If you see him at collision, just know in his bag back at the hotel, there's the shed travel bag from Manscaped and he's probably rocking his Manscaped boxer briefs and you should be too. Who is the commissioner these days? That's you daddy. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. It's time to put the PP back in PPR and get a <laughs> grip on your pig skin this season. Wow. Manscaped. Creative coffee this week from our friends at Manscaped. I love it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right, and you, right guys were so, you guys were so creative on raw in this era, man. You beat nitro. Nine out of 10 times and you crushed this debut on Sunday night heat, but the following day, man, raw is from San Diego and you hit a 4.98 rating and an 8.4 share that San Diego show is notable because your great close personal friend, Christopher Daniels has a dark match here. Right. And yeah. man, when you think about all the success that he enjoyed in TNA and of course these days. Uh, helping run things behind the scenes with AEW. I mean, he's had so much success in ring of honor and TNA and certainly pro wrestling gorilla and over in Japan, but he never really had much of an opportunity in the WWE. Why do you think that never worked out for him? Just, uh, Vince didn't see it. He didn't feel it. Uh, you know, Chris is not the biggest dude in the, in the fight, but he's a te tremendous talent, very skilled. It's just that one, one guy. And I, I, and I also don't know, uh, Cotty, I don't know what Russo thought of, uh, Christopher Daniels. If I, if it, if it had been brought to me and they said, we want you to hire Christopher Daniels because we have an idea created for him. I'd have no, no problem with that. Cause he's a good guy. He's a soldier and uh, he's a good worker. Could work a lot of different styles, but that never came across my purview. Uh, I know we brought him in for a tryout and I, I, I don't recall it being bad. Uh, he's a, you know, kind of a, who's known as a kind of a high spot guy, but he could work as well. So, uh, just didn't work out for him. I guess is all I can say. Never, if it had come across my desk and Hey, we <coughs> JR get a hold of Christopher Daniels. We want you to uh, sign him. I'd have done it in a heartbeat. We should also mention that Golga, the former earthquake, he's a part of the oddities. And now Sable is his manager on raw. He's going to beat Mark Mero, uh, and then Silva and Kurgan are going to come out in tuxedos singing. There she is. Miss America. As Luna comes prancing down the aisle, uh, Meltzer would say, it looks like they're trying to set up a Luna versus Jackie program and Sable in his opinion seemed well uncomfortable in this new role. 
but we should also mention there's another cat running around here. The Jackal Meltzer would say, apparently they do feel that the Jackal has big time potential as a manager, but feel that this isn't the group to put him with. Um, of course this is Don Callis years before he was trying to ruin Kenny Omega's life. He had a cup of coffee here in the WWE. And, and again, it felt like, man, this guy is going to be a thing. I mean, I think once upon a time that he was even suggested as teaming with Bret Hart once before that doesn't work out. Now he's going to be here with the truth commission in 97. Now we're trying him as this leader of sorts of the oddities, man. Is this just a case of bad creative, bad timing? It's bad not the timing, li- bad yeah. timing, Conrad, more than anything. I, if it had worked, it would not have been bad creative. Yeah. Uh, but you look at who you're, who he was managing. Uh, I did some commentary with him, uh, on some shows and realized right away. He's a hell of a talker. Now he may be a miserable prick in real life. And some people would agree with that assessment of Don, but nobody can disagree with the fact that Don is a very intelligent, uh, and he thinks for Don. So, uh, you know, old school. How do I get over brother type deal? So, uh, but he could talk, man, from the get go, one of the best talkers that, and I thought that's what, what I thought that would be his calling as a broadcaster, not as a manager, not that he couldn't be a manager and not could, and not that he couldn't do a good job. It's just the fact that, uh, when you, can, you stumble across a guy that can really talk is a good listener and ha- and has the ability to talk in sound bites. So he's not on and on and on. Uh, you know, you're, 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 you're lucky. So that, that's how I looked at Don. I thought we'd found a real, uh, first rate, uh, let him evolve, help him out. And uh, he's smart enough to understand what he's doing right and what he's doing wrong. And he, you know, like I said, he was a good listener and, uh, and he wanted to, to do well. So I, I, we didn't do a good job in the, then Connie, in my opinion of maximizing the minutes for uh, Don Callis. It's, it was a mistake on how he was handled there. And that might've been partially Don's situation. Don had a lot of self-confidence. Uh, he had been around the business long enough to know all the, the good brothers and the bad brothers and all that stuff. So, uh, I don't know if that did him any favors, but nonetheless, talented dude. And we kind of blew it with him, uh, in that, uh, in that era, I, I thought. I wanted to, uh, to mention, we do another piece of business here with Hawk where now he's doing an interview where he says, I'm Michael Hegstrand and I want to apologize for my behavior. When I was pretending to be loaded, he's apologizing here for embarrassing the company, his partner, all the wrestlers and all the fans. And I guess the story is here. He's going to try to make a comeback from drug addiction. And then that leads to him wrestling Jeff Jarrett in a match. He gets the win in two and a half minutes. We've repackaged the Godwins. Now they're going to be called Southern justice. Uh, they're out here with, uh, suits and I don't know. They look like some mafia type characters. Yeah. From, and, uh, Pikesville, Kentucky <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Right. It's like the Memphis mafia that was with Elvis or something like that. Correct. There you go. Um, what do you think of this creative of this once upon a time, cartoon character, comic book, superhero Hawk saying I'm Michael Hegstrand. And I don't yeah. know, man, that, that, that was a miss for me. What say you, I'm, it missed me too, Connie. I didn't like it. And I'm sitting there where I got to put it over. All right. right. It, it's a matter of, it's, it's interesting. Uh, all, and the things like on things like this, I found out for me, it's best to just react to what I'm seeing instead of editorializing it, because quite frankly, uh, I thought that was one of the stupidest things that we had done in a long time. Uh, you know, it's reality based. I get it. And drugs were getting more and more prominent and more and more athletes and players and actors and so forth were having drug issues. So I, I understand that. I just didn't like the topic. I don't like, I just don't like things like that. I, I, I don't like religion involved in, 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 in booking wrestling, creative, uh, politics. I don't like that either. People if you hear enough of that shit. They, they turn on the news during certain news cycles and it's all, it's all that. 
And uh, so I thought there, there had to be better ways to, uh, you know, what Hawk needed was rehab. And he needed an in-treatment rehab program that was staunch and, and a little bit stiff maybe, but he was going to, he, he's going to happen. It's going to happen. What we, what did happen, Connie, he died. And I don't think that, uh, the people were, I don't know what Russo knew exactly how bad Hawks drug issues were, but you know, it was uh, pretty obvious it was serious, but, and then we're flirting with disaster as it worked out. It come back and bit us in the ass because that's exactly what happened. Uh, he, he didn't get the help he needed. He didn't adhere to the, re, to the rehab opportunities. And all of a sudden, bam, he's six feet under. And that's not exactly what you want. Obviously. Our next segment is uh, Val Venus teaming with Taka Michinoku to take on Men's Tao and Dick to go. Uh, in their corner is Yamaguchi son and Funaki. There's a DQ here. Eventually, uh, Mrs. Yamaguchi son can't watch because they've overwhelmed Val. They're about to attack him. And Yamaguchi son reveals that Mrs. Yamaguchi is not his wife, but actually his sister. And they're dragging Val to the back. And Lawler is wondering if they're going to choppy choppy his PP. And in the next segment, Tiger Ali Singh is doing his best million dollar man gimmick. And there's a heavy set lady in the audience they bring into the ring, and he gives her $500 to take off her clothes. And she does this quite willingly. And then Tiger gives her $500 to put her clothes back on. Man, what a crazy era for wrestling. And it feels like I'm asking this question a lot, but Tiger Ali Singh, man, we're trying something. You know, this guy has been on the roster for a little bit, and he's, of course, been working with Dory Funk and working in all the dojos and camps. And yeah. we're trying to give him a new gimmick and persona and look and heel feel. And I don't know that it ever really connected. Um, do you think it was just too similar to the million dollar man thing? Was he not uh, able to pull it off or something else? He just wasn't able to pull it off. Connie. He didn't connect to the audience, uh, as much as he and, uh, WWE wanted. Um, so I, I never really, uh, compared it to the million dollar man thing, even though it's easy to do. And I see what you're saying. I don't disagree. Uh, he just never connected to the audience. We believe that Tiger Ali Singh, who had his father was famous and yeah. was crazy, uh, heel and, and all that stuff. He was very successful and made lots and lots of money. They lived in Toronto. So when we brought, uh, Tiger in, we had to change his name. Uh, and we, uh, that, that was a whole day friggin' meeting there. Uh, it was just you know, crazy. You just, what are we going to call him? Then everybody right. had, every, there's so many cooks in the kitchen. It started spoiling the stew. Uh, so tiger was, uh, uh, after his dad, tiger Jeet Singh and Ali was the obvious Muhammad Ali. And so, uh, it was just, uh, it was. It sounds simple. We should have done it in 10 minutes, but it was almost an all day deal. And then when we started talking about travel, you know, Vince is very reluctant to fly anybody first class. A uh, few guys got that luxury. So what he wanted, he meaning tiger pronoun boy, uh, was to, uh, he wanted to fly first class on the last leg into Toronto. So that when he got off the plane and there were fans there or, or what have you. They would see him on a, with a nice suit coming off the plane. One of the first people off the plane, obviously flying first class, but he only flew first class to that last leg. And, uh, so that was kind of unique to me. Vince going along with it. So, Hey, if the head honcho goes along with it, who am I to say it's not going to, that's not good. Right. So, uh, anyway, that was, that was a unique, I never quite experienced that before. Yeah, just the last worked. leg. I'd never heard of that either. That's yeah, just the last leg. Just just getting off in the Toronto airport uh in a suit and tie, which he wore most all the time anyway. Or or he did. He looked good. He was a good looking kid. Handsome, athletic, just didn't have the experience in the territories where he's working before paying customers every night. 
uh, just didn't have it and it didn't work. So, uh, but we tried, we really did. We really tried. It's just, you know, he, here's what I'll say. Uh, Tiger Ali Singh did not have the charisma that his dad did. His dad was a legend and he, he knew what he was, how to get over. Uh, you know, he's been around the block, knew all the tricks of the trade, all that stuff, but he had charisma and he knew how to use his charisma to his advantage and the kid didn't. So, uh, that was the Tiger Ali Singh story that I wish he'd have made it because we were looking at him being our big top baby face in India. And that was a lot that could potentially have been a lot of money for WWE in a new territory. So, uh, with a big population. So anyhow, that was, you know, I wish Tiger had made, had made it. We spent a lot of time on him. I can tell you that we had meetings after meetings and his dad was a little high maintenance, which didn't do Tiger Ali Singh any favors. Uh, so in any event, a good kid race, right. Just didn't have the, the resume to be put in that position in, on a, as a top type guy. Well, I know what you're thinking, man, Monday night raw things are hot. What's the, what's the main event segment? How do we go off the air? We go off the air when we're backstage and we see Val hanging naked from the ceiling and Yamaguchi son is going to swing, sing, swing a sword. Easy for me to say simulating choppy, choppy PP Val is screaming as the show goes off the air, man, I understand we want cliffhanger TV, but what something, something was hanging in the balance, Conrad, literally hanging in the balance. My goodness. Yeah. That's what I said. Among other things. Uh, then what else was hanging in the balance is, uh, Vader's career on heat. We're going to have Mark Henry just destroy Vader, but never pin him. I mean, it's probably time for him to just move on. And speaking of moving on Brian Lee, who we knew his chains was fired because apparently he was arrested. And it was reported in the local media in Tennessee that the undertaker was arrested. And of course he did technically portray the undertaker back in 1994. I know you're a big part of talent relations in this era. What do you remember the real reason being for, uh, for Lee's dismissal? Was it the arrest? And do you recall the terms of that arrest? I don't know. I can't remember what, uh, he did. Was right. it D U I? I don't know. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been that long ago. And. Uh, Brian's a nice guy. Uh, I, I felt bad, but that was, that was not a decision that I came to easily or on my own. Uh, that was the edict from the old man, you know, let him, you know, cause he didn't Brian at that time did not have a lot of, uh, manageable, recognizable star power, big kid, athletic just another one of those guys that for whatever reason at that point in his career, just not, did not connect, uh, to the audience and, a, and a, to a level that they would invest money in for pay-per-views or tickets or merch or what have you. So, uh, Brian didn't get a second chance in, at that time. Uh, and he had a lot of in, in office, uh, uh, stroke cause he, had, he was buddies with the undertaker and that meant something. And it still means something. So, uh, it was just, uh, one of those deals where, you know, I, I had the unenviable task of informing him that we would no longer be doing business. And I felt bad about it, but, uh, that was a Vince call and I followed my marching orders as a good soldier will do. Over the weekend, uh, between Monday night Raw's here, we see a couple of big shows in Toronto and Montreal. They bring out Pat Patterson. He's going to referee the triple threat matches on top. We got Jason sensation involved here doing the ring announcing for Owen Hart versus Ken Shamrock. And the crowd is just eating it up. But I bring up these two shows in Toronto and Montreal. These are non-televised events. These are house shows as we called them at the time. These are the last two shows for Terry Funk in the WWF. He's going to wrestle mankind in both of those shows. Falls count anywhere matches who better to wrestle Terry on his last two nights in. I think we all would have liked a storybook ending and maybe it was on TV and maybe it was in Texas, but it wound up being in front of 
big crowds in Toronto and Montreal with one of his best friends. And it's sort of the end of an era, man. I mean, Terry Funk had been wrestling on and off with you guys since the mid eighties with Hogan on Saturday night's main event. And now here in 1998, we're winding her down for Terry Funk here in the Who did he work with? Mick Foley is mankind. Oh, okay. That makes sense. That's the only, yeah. that's really the only logical choice. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, look, people oftentimes have asked me, why'd you hire this guy? Why'd you hire that guy? Well, the, the thing about Terry Funk is that, that he had the ability and the willingness to share his wisdom with, uh, uh, the younger talents. He would see things in younger talents that maybe others didn't, and he would help them cycle their psychological approach to the business, et cetera, et cetera. So Terry brought a lot with him on a positive scale. Was he the worker that he used to be? Well, no, how could he be at that, at his age, at that point, uh, and his whole body was, you know, these guys were, he came from an era where if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. So you worked hurt all the time. So I, he was a very valuable, com, uh, a proponent or component of, uh, of our roster and was maybe arguably more valuable as a coach mentor type guy than he even was in the ring. However, if you look back at those matches, he, uh, he, he always delivered. He'd always pull something out of his hat. He would always have a new trick up his sleeve, so to speak. And, uh, he was just tremendous. Great. Uh, that was a great hire. I'm not pat myself on the back, but it was a great hire for any company to get a guy like Terry, uh, that can, uh, mentor and coach up these kids. And he did a great job at that. We, uh, we should talk about somebody else who's doing a great job and that's stone cold, Steve Austin. He's helped lead this company to brand new heights and the USA today. Can't wait to talk about it. It's, uh, the front page of their life section. It comes out on August 6th and it's not just stone cold on the cover here. It's also bill Goldberg and Goldberg is being quoted as saying, I respect the guy for what he's done, but I don't respect him enough to copy him. Steve Austin is known as one of the best promo guys in the world, but Steve Austin doesn't do one thing that I can do in the ring. And <laughs> Austin replies. Goldberg is squashing people with his power moves. And that's great. He doesn't know the psychology yet. I'm able to go out there and take fans on a 30 minute roller coaster ride. And to be clear, folks, this isn't, these aren't quotes from the torch. This isn't an interview that happened with Dave Meltzer in the observer. This is the USA freaking today. Yep. This is a pretty big damn deal. Not just for you guys, but for all of wrestling, right? Yeah, well, of course, acknowledge that the, that the genre still existed and was healthy. Uh, it was good. So, uh, and they, those guys were just open and honest as the best they knew it. Uh, I might have probably helped Bill a little bit on his comments. I don't know how, how favorable that made him look, but nonetheless, uh, he was hot and doing a great job and both he and Austin were bald. Both of them had goatees. Both of them were heavy hitters. They had a lot in common in that regard, but Steve was right. You know, Bill didn't have the experience at that time to do much more than a, a, a an enhanced squash match. Austin had the ability to have a match with anybody on the roster and make it a main event level performance. So, uh, and I'm, and I'm biased to be honest with you, you know, Steve's my buddy and still is, he called me the other day, to see how I was doing checks on me, which I appreciate. So, uh, anyhow, it was, uh, it was a great PR. It, it created an awareness of the genre again, where in the past, in the, in the past, uh, there was none, nobody at USA today. Wasn't writing about pro wrestling on a, on a weekly basis. This is new and it was uh, fresh and I think it helped both companies. It's interesting because it's not just Austin and Goldberg who are quoted here. They're going to reference that Jay Leno is now getting involved with WCW and they're asking Vince McMahon what he thinks about that. And of course the Monday night wars and Vince is quoted as saying it's the same old Hulk Hogan situation. Every time Hogan is on the air, we clobber them. 
It's a tired old situation. And Hogan, of course, is asked about retiring due to back and knee problems. And he says, my wife doesn't want me to quit. My kids don't want me to quit. The promoters don't want me to quit. The fans don't want me to quit. And the IRS really doesn't want me to quit. <laughs> I think that's uh, pretty fun. And of course the WWF is going to also be making some headlines in this era, but now they're getting in the real estate game. And Bruce and I've touched on this before, but I want your take. I don't think we've ever discussed it, but this is a story that picked up some national attention that Titan sports is part of a conglomerate that wind up being the top bidders for the Debbie Reynolds hotel and casino in Las Vegas. Right. It was a group headed by George Simon of Cleveland and the high bid in an auction that only drew six people was $9 million. So at least it sounds like at least once upon a time, there was an idea. Do you remember hearing an idea for a WWF casino? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. That was the plan. Hotel and casino memorabilia, uh, everywhere like a little hall of fame or, a, or, a maybe better said a hall, uh, yeah, uh, almost a cathedral for WWE history. And, uh, so that was going to be the idea. It was in a decent location. It'd been around for a long time. Uh, you know, it was sold under duress, obviously. I mean, you can't touch a piece of property in Vegas right now for $9 million in that, that location. So it seemed like on the surface, it had merit. It just didn't work out. Well, what else isn't working out is the streak. Monday night raw is going to lose this streak that they've started beating nitro every single week. And Meltzer would say perhaps it's because of the interest from Jay Leno. And I couldn't help, but wonder, or maybe it's because we didn't care about Val Venus getting his wiener chopped off. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe it uh, just didn't resonate with people that as much as the company thought it might curiosity aspect of being something different and crazy and out there. Uh, it just wasn't a topic that was universally popular. It didn't seem like, but I will say it was different. I will say it was new. Uh, I will say it was, uh, crazy, but I also will say I didn't like it. I just didn't think it was long-term. I like stone cold. I like Mr. McMahon. I liked the wrestling side. We had great wrestling talent and a lot of them were not getting their TV time that they, many of them believed that they deserved and needed uh, because of this other content. So because it kept others off the TV to some degree, uh, I thought it was a, a failure, quite frankly. Rocket money is not a failure. And that is a popular topic for everyone. Keeping more of your own money. This is something I really believe in. And I have to admit, I thought when we first heard about rocket money, well, I'm on top of my stuff that that couldn't save me. Yeah. Either. Good luck well, on that. Here's what, here's what happens guys. You sign up for subscriptions and then you kind of forget about it. Maybe it's one of those deals where it's try it free for so-and-so days. And then you forget about it. What happened to me is I bought the zone and I needed to have that monthly subscription for like 70 bucks or whatever it was. I really only wanted to watch one fight. Well, that fight was like 13 months prior to when I discovered that I was still paying for it. Rocket money saved me all that cash. Rocket money will also alert you if there's an increase in subscription price. How about this? They can even negotiate for you. Yeah, they can do it all. Rocket money can cancel a subscription for you that otherwise would be tricky or time consuming. And they do it with just one press of the button. Yep. The other thing rocket money did for me is it showed that both my wife and I were paying for Hulu, man. We watch TV together. We don't need two accounts. But we didn't even know she had it on hers. I had it on my, we didn't know if these subscriptions are flying under your radar. Let me tell you, they're probably draining your wallet and you didn't even realize it. You see the average person has around 12 paid subscriptions and you probably don't remember even like half of those. Right. I'll be honest. I didn't really think, I, I didn't think they could save me any money. I thought, well, I'm on top of this. I got it. I didn't know the half of what I was signed up for. It blew my mind. And I think it'll save you a boatload of cash. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions. They simply forgot about whether it's a streaming service or a fitness program. It's really almost impossible to keep up with every penny because we all sort of just sit it and forget it. And then there it is. But rocket money, 
and they're a personal finance app that helps you find and cancel all of those unwanted subscriptions. It'll also monitor your spending and help you lower all your bills all in one place. You see, most folks think they're spending like 80 bucks a month on subscriptions. In reality, it's probably closer to like $200. And with Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the ones you don't want with just the press of a button. You don't have to get on the phone and, and be on hold with customer service or send a bunch of annoying emails. Rocket Money does all the work for you. They can even negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you do, and this is fantastic folks, all you do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money will take care of the rest. These guys are on your side. They're going to monitor all your expenses in one place. They'll help you create custom budgets based on your past spending. They'll even send you notifications when you've reached your spending limits. With over 3 million users and counting, Rocket Money customers have saved an average of $720 a year. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash JR. That's rocketmoney.com slash JR. Our monies are hard to come by. We work hard for our cash and uh, I'm right there with you, Conrad. This is a great idea. It's a great concept. Uh, rocketmoney.com slash JR is where you want to head. And uh, I have no idea and I'm, I'm getting ready to subscribe uh, to this service because I believe in it. And I know I'm wasting a lot of money on impulse buys. Yeah. And I'm sure some of you are too. So, uh, check it out. And, and, uh, and I think you'll be very happy that you're saving a lot of hard earned cash. It's too hard to come by. You know, it's just, it just makes no sense to continue to, uh, pay for useless subscriptions and they could take care of that problem for you. So it's a great concept, great idea, good people, and it'll save you some cash. Your, your better, your other half will be very happy that you're making a wise decision on how you invest your money. Because right now it's being washed down the toilet, uh, on things that you don't even need. That's rocketmoney.com slash JR cancel useless unwanted subscriptions today. Start saving money. Uh, so let's talk about it. We're back on the road in Omaha. We got another sellout. We're all starting with mankind doing an interview saying he can't trust anyone. Uh, mankind is going to go ahead and invite Vince McMahon out. McMahon is going to start, uh, really beating on mankind for being weak and pathetic and not sort of say over overacting maybe. And then here comes Kane and the undertaker in collusion to destroy everyone else in the company. Um, there's a bit of an argument here. Vince is claiming it's undertaker in the Kane costume. He wants him to take off the mask when, they, when, when the lights come back on, Kane is gone and the undertaker has his hands on McMahon. So the undertaker is going to beat on mankind and bear and then chase McMahon away. We're just six weeks before Mick Foley was doing some really crazy stuff, man. I mean, flying off the top of the cage and all this. Now it feels like he's just floating around. Do you think in hindsight, there should have been more focus on mankind's story? I mean, after flying off the cage and this huge moment that we're st still talking about, right. I think maybe what's lost in the shuffle all these years later is we don't talk about how that was never really followed up on. Like that didn't lead to this next great story. He's just kind of here. I mean, certainly the story is he survived, right. but it does feel like, man, after doing that, the dude deserves some juicy creative that just really wasn't there for him. Yeah. It was uh, hard to follow up on something so spectacular that could never occur again. Uh, but I'm with you. It should have probably been uh, the follow through should have been better and it could have been better. And, uh, but it wasn't, but still he was so over he being Mick. Uh, that we kind of caught up with that pretty quick because he got back involved in the storyline and, and all that good stuff. So, but I'm with you, Conrad, probably a little bit uneventful, uh, on the follow-up of the uh, hell in a cell in Pittsburgh. So, uh, June, 1998, I'll never forget it. So, uh, yeah, it was, could have been better, could have been better, but it, it, it wasn't a total washout. Uh, he still got some, some juice left in him. He being Mick again. So 
pretty cool. And anyway, we got some other characters involved, Kane for one. And, uh, so it was good. And then anytime you can add the element of Mr. McMahon to that equation, uh, you got a good chance of being successful. We're going to see the oddities out here again. Uh, Luna is going to be wrestling Jackie Sable's getting involved, but the oddities are here. And Meltzer would say they're trying to make them this generation's bushwhackers with fans dancing in the crowd. And when you think back a generation before you probably think about the road warriors next up, LOD is supposed to be facing Southern justice, but Hawk is doing his stone deck and falling down the ramp. The officials aren't letting him wrestle. It's really a sad deal, but what is fun is we see a, a new coat of paint for Jeff Jarrett. He shows up with a beard, looks like a different dude. And he's got a guitar that says, don't piss me off. <laughs> this he's going to nail draws off and then start cutting his hair. Of course, we're building towards a hair match for him at, uh, at SummerSlam. but this is probably the best version of Jeff Jarrett we've had thus far in the WWF. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. I think it was, you know, uh, finally got some creative that was custom for him and, you know, Jeff always was a good worker. So, uh, he just needed some creative assist and, and, and guys like him, he's, he's harking back to what I said earlier about Terry Funk. You know, Jeff was a lifer in pro wrestling. He came from a pro wrestling family with his grandma and his dad. Uh, so, uh, he just needed some, some creative that he could sink his teeth in. And, uh, they thought that, uh, his situation with draws and the hair, uh, might get that done. The issue was that, you know, draws, God bless his soul. He left us a week or two ago where it was, uh, you know, after living in a wheelchair forever, God bless him. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it, but he did. Uh, but you know, we didn't take in consideration that draws wasn't over. So I don't know that people cared about, uh, draws and his his, his, uh, difficulties, but, uh, it was at least to give Jeff something to work with. And I think that was the key thing. Well, we need something for Dustin to do because we're going to try something with him that I don't think we would have ever seen before or after he appears on screen. And if you're watching over on YouTube, it's hard to believe this ever happened, but he's, uh, seated against the backdrop doing a pre-recorded announcement, telling people don't watch the next segment because it deals with genitalia and fornication outside of marriage. And they're doing a spoof saying that this announcement was paid for by religious groups that hate all forms of entertainment. Of course, in real life, they're getting a lot of criticism for the content of the shows. People are counting the number of times there's crotch chops and people saying suck it and middle fingers and all this risque content. Yeah. So we're just leaning into it here with the guy who used to portray gold dust. And now Val Venus comes out. This is real with John Wayne Bobbitt. Now you might be saying to yourself, self, is that an old territory guy? Not exactly. This is a guy who made a lot of news a handful of years prior because his wife, Lorena choppy choppied his PP for real. real life. Yeah. Oh God. And then he had it reattached and became a porn actor. And now he's on WWE programming. I'm not making any of this up. This all really happened. And Meltzer would say that this came off really moronically. And Val is explaining that they put his gimmick on the chopping block, but because it was so cold, it shrunk. <laughs> and Bob had made the save, turning out the lights. And Wally didn't chop nothing. And then Val dumped Mrs. Yamaguchi son because she was more trouble than she was worth. And he threw her a battery so she could keep herself satisfied. Classy Jim, at this point, are you feeling less like you're calling wrestling and more like you're calling Jerry Springer? Yeah, absolutely. What else could yeah. you compare it to quite frankly? I don't, I I don't know. I, I, it was, you just navigate, you know, thank God I had Lawler with me. And so, you know, Lawler could make anything entertaining my opinion, he's still the best, uh, best partner I ever work with. And I work with some really good guys and not knocking them at all, but Lawler was special and he liked that kind of stuff. He, he, uh, he embraced it. So, you know, Hey, look, 
it's written, it's on the sheet, it's on the format, you go with it. And those are the kind of things that where the announcers oftentimes are better off laying out and letting the video speak for itself without trying to add editorial content to it. And, uh, that's kind of what we did. There was a lot of layouts and then Lawler had his humor and, uh, his one liners and kind of made it passable, I guess, but it was, uh, very controversial and I wasn't used to that, uh, type of, uh, presentation. So I figured the best thing for me to do more often than not just to lay out, let the video tell its story. They're doing ring intros for the four corners match. When Ken Shamrock does a run in puts the ankle lock on Owen Hart. DX is going to keep Rocky Maivia from helping D'Lo winds up substituting for Owen Hart in this four corners match. Uh, so it's mankind and Kane, new age outlaws and Austin and undertaker. The tag belts are at stake and Meltzer would say it went 1430 and it was pretty good, especially when Austin was in. But it slowed toward the end because the Undertaker looked pretty bad. To to remind everybody, the Undertaker is very hurt here. He can yeah. barely walk. His ankle is super jacked. But he's out here gutting it out because the company needs him and he wants the paydays. The finish would see Kane pin Undertaker after one choke slam. So mankind and Kane got the belts. And then Undertaker immediately pops up. Let me explain that. The story here is Undertaker did the favor for his brother Kane to screw Austin out of the tag title. So that's how we're going to start building towards undertaker versus Austin. They were the tag champs, but because the undertaker laid down for his brother, no more. And we should also mention in this era, it was in the newsletter all the time that the undertaker was so hurt. He's probably going to be retiring anytime now. Yeah. That was a rumor. He was hurt bad, Conrad. He was a lot of guys would have gone home. Yes, they would have. And, uh, but Taker was such a team player. You know, he was your captain. He was the, I, I've used this before. He was the conscience of the WWF. Uh, he, he was the yardstick. And, uh, the last thing you want to go to Mark undertaker is say, well, we need to take you. You need to go home. Right. That was, that was just. You weren't going to do that because that was a, that would be an insult. He toughed it out, man. And it proved once again, he's as tough as anybody in the business, anybody, uh, cause what he went through was excruciating, but he, he made it work as best as he could. We should mention that, uh, gang grill is going to make his debut. That's right. The gang girl character debuts here just a couple of weeks after the Godfather character. Meltzer would write, he comes out drinking blood and spills it all over him doing a vampire gimmick with a poofy shirt. One of the all time great entrances in, in wrestling history, Jim, one yep. of the all time great theme songs, great music. But then when the, when the bell rang, I don't know that he was as convincing maybe as we wanted him to be as a vampire, or I don't even know what that even means. A vampire wrestling. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, the, the entrance man, people are still excited about it all these years later. Yeah, it's great music. It worked. That's why music's so important to the presentations of pro wrestling and still are, if not even more today. Look at what we're doing in AEW. Yeah. You know, Tony Khan uh, uh making arrangements to have, you know, customized music, uh, established music for a variety of our talents because it is that important. And now that the fans have real realized what whose music is who, uh it work it starts working even better. So, uh, the music is a huge element. Uh, you know, it's like Austin's glass breaking. We talk about it in, in endlessly when that glass broke, you knew all hell was going to break loose. Something special is going to happen. And your top star is in route to the ring. We should, uh, remind you that Owen is going to announce that Dan Severin is going to be his trainer for his match with Shamrock at SummerSlam. When Shamrock finds out, he goes nuts again. Of course, we know this is building towards a Lions Den match at SummerSlam in the Paramount Theater. Um, remember now, back at Fully Loaded, they did one in the Heart Dungeon. So now it's going to be the Lions Den. So we did one on your turf. Now we're going to do one on on my turf sort of deal. Uh, next up, we've got Val Venus. 
He's going to be in there with all the members of Kai and Tai in order to get a match himself with Yamaguchi. And, uh, he runs through him, man. He beats men's Tao with a fisherman suplex for It takes him all of 10 seconds with a power slam, uh, Togo in two minutes. And, uh, he loses clean in the middle with Taka's Michinoku driver, but he makes a comeback and sprays them all with a super soaker because he's a porn star. You see, <laughs> My goodness. and it's pink. The super soaker was uh, flesh colored. My goodness. How about that? That's where you lay out, baby. You just lay out and let it, uh, do its thing and let Lawler do his thing. Easy for me as a very easy angle to explain. Lay WCW out. is desperate on the other channel. You know, they, uh, they want to keep this momentum going after, you know, we've had uh, maybe a fumble because of, uh, Val Venus, or maybe they've got a little bit of that Jay Leno tonight show mainstream rub who knows. But they hit the panic button and the ultimate warrior is back, but he's on the WCW side of things. And you guys aren't just up against warrior. You're up against Monday night football. Preseason football is back with the Packers and the Broncos. Let me give that some context. Those teams played in the super bowl. So it's a rematch from the super bowl. I know. Yes. It's the preseason, but these are the same teams that played in the super bowl. And that does a 9.5 rating. Nitro with the ultimate warrior does a 5.2 and raw does a 4.7. So you did lose, but maybe some of that's football. Maybe some of that's the ultimate warrior. Maybe some of that's not really because we care about Valvanus as wiener. Could be, uh, that would be the latter. The last thing you said probably would, would be the box I would check. Yeah. It just wasn't, it, it didn't, it didn't resonate with the audience. Uh, there was, I would suggest in our fandom there were a lot of eyeball rolling on that deal and that's not a good emotion for wrestling it's where you roll your eyes oh my god are you kidding me type deal so uh yeah it was it was uh i think i think the the angle that we shot didn't get over i think that football had a huge impact on the male 18 to 34 18 to 49 demographic as it would and for the reasons you mentioned not only because it was just a, like right now we're in the preseason. It may not seem as important to some as it does to others, especially those guys trying to make a team that 53 man roster. So, uh, and I, and I don't know, and you got to give warrior some credit, obviously, I don't know how much, but you got to give him some credit for, uh, popping a number it, but once you see him, his game is the same. He doesn't have a variety of move sets. He's not a great storyteller. Uh, he meaning warrior, just, it's just, uh, one hit wonder type thing. Cause he's not going to do anything different for you. You know, he's not going to do, he's not going to probably put anybody over, uh, his, his work is what it is, but, uh, the fact that he's advertised or, or not, I don't know if he was even advertising that show. I'm assuming he was, I don't know. So anyhow, uh. He wasn't, it was a surprise. Okay. Uh, Bischoff used to really love surprises and it worked. The segment goes a long time. You know, it's probably over before it got going, but I wanted to know in your opinion, I mean, listen, we've all heard that Vince likes to take ownership over his ideas. And if it was somebody else's idea or it got over somewhere else, he wasn't as fond of it. I mean, we know that, all right. But the ultimate warrior didn't start his professional wrestling career with Vince. I mean, he had gone through Memphis and certainly gone through in Dallas and mid South and, and, and then, and then he really started to reach his highest peak of success in the WWF so much that they put him in the WrestleMania main event and, and crowned him, you know, the successor for Hulk Hogan. And we all know the story from there. Box offices were down. It didn't quite work out, but Vince had so much confidence in him that he brought him back in 96. And we've talked about that before. Just what a nightmare that was. Yeah. But when he sees, Hey man, this guy is going to work for WCW. I think a lot of people probably would say, oh, well, he was probably excited because it didn't work in 96. Well, that's not really true. There was an offer letter. This is floated out. It's been posted online where Vince made a pretty substantial offer in late 97 on the heels of Brett leaving, he's reaching out and making an offer for the ultimate warrior to come work for him. Instead, 
Weir goes to work for Eric Bischoff. Do you remember this being annoying, frustrating? Did it piss the chairman off? Well, a lot of guys on our side didn't really believe that the warrior was the answer. Right. So we didn't have a lot of, uh, uh, weren't despondent over the fact that we didn't get him. Uh, a lot of the guys in the front office, the Patterson's of the world and so forth, maybe even Bruce knew the limitations of, of warrior. We're not getting a great worker. We're getting an attraction. Attractions to work have to be used sparingly and keep and be, and be made to keep special. And, uh, so that was how I looked at a lot of us looked at the same thing. He's an attraction. You can get one off on him and he'll help you out there. Uh, if you, if you don't overexpose him, he can probably still give you a little bit of a rub. Uh, but most guys didn't have the confidence that warrior was the answer to our issues. You, you don't replace a Bret Hart with anybody that I know of. Sands maybe in Austin, uh, and it worked. So it was a, it wasn't a, it, when, when, when warrior went to, uh, work for Eric, it didn't drive everybody crazy because we knew what Eric was getting. He's getting an attraction. And as long as you don't try to make a uh, warrior, something that he's not being an attraction, then you might, you know, you might get some sporadic use out of him and he might do a nice rub for. For some guys, but he's not going to put anybody over. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do the honors to, to any degree, maybe occasionally, but, uh, in any event, he was, it wasn't a big thing. And you know, warrior, I had been around warrior when he, when he was young, uh, when he was half of the blade runners, it was going to be Watts's version of the road warriors. And he was teaming with sting and the cowboy saw nothing in warrior, which is hard to maybe fathom or process for some people cowboy wanted guys that could work and he wanted tough guys. He didn't believe that warrior was either of those two things. And so he warrior then got cut and went to Dallas to work with uh, Fritz, Fritz von Eric and Gary Hart was just going to be his manager. I think that helped him some without question. If Gary Hart had come to WWF with the warrior. It might've helped that transition better because Gary Hart was a shrewd Gary Hart was a lot like Don Callis. He thought like a heel 24 seven. So he could probably help him there some, but it didn't happen that way. But, uh, Vince loved the look, man. He loved the eight by tens. He loved the covers of magazines with warrior on it. Uh, a lot of things, a lot of boxes that warrior checked, but being a great worker was not one of them. Well, if you're looking to check some boxes, maybe you're looking to make a big thing, have somebody put you over and get that rub. Can I recommend blue chew and yes, it's going to have your gimmick feeling like the ultimate warrior. Dun, 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 dun. That's what it's going to feel like pulsing through that rascal. And you'll believe in the power of the warrior. blue chew is an online service boys and girls that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis and Levitra but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. And there's no destrucity here. Take them anytime, day or night. You can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Load up the rocket ship because the process is simple. You sign up at bluechew.com. You consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you receive your prescription within a few days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. No visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations. No waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. Seriously, folks, this is a game changer. All of our episodes for years now have been sponsored by Blue Chew because it really works and it won't dis disappoint you like an Ultimate Warrior match or promo in 1998. But you're a little warrior. Man, he's... uh. He's ready to get put over daddy. Blue chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we got a special deal for our listeners. Try blue chew for free. When you use our promo code, J aren't checkout, just pay the $5 shipping. That's it. Bluechew.com. The promo code JR and bam, you got your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank blue chew for sponsoring the podcast. And by God, Jim Ross's wiener. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'll tell you this. 
Blue Chew is one of the few products that I've ever used that has worked every single time. Come on. Yes, sir. So it was, it's, it's not like every now and then it works, whatever, every time. And that's not an exaggeration. That's not some bullshit sales pitch. It's fact. So uh, check out bluechew.com and hey, that's a pretty hell, hellacious deal. First month is free. That's free for me. Come on. And, and you pay $5 shipping. So, uh, you'll get, you'll get more than $5 uh, out of it. The first time you pop a blue, blue, <laughs> blue pill, I can promise you. So, and especially for guys, you know, we, we start losing things when we're older and man, I get everything back from blue Chew. So it, it's, it works folks. It works. And it, that's all I can say to you. And you'll be very happy. You give it a, a shot. And this is the time you've heard about it. We talked about it. They've been a sponsor forever. We love them because their product works and they, they hang with us first month free, pay $5 shipping. I don't know how you get a better deal. I don't think you can check it out. Bluetooth.com and be sure to use our promo code JR. Hey, let's also mention that, uh, on the build the SummerSlam, and this hasn't get talked about enough. You guys aren't even on Mondays anymore. Raw has moved to Saturday because of the U S open. And oh, by the way, no stress. You're about to sell your second biggest pay-per-view of the year. All right. Uh, but Not boy, well, yeah, but while the, 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 the short-term future looks bleak, the long-term future looks fantastic. You guys are running camps, trying to find the next crop of superstars. How about this crop? Scott Taylor, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Kurt Angle, Sean Stasiak, Andrew Martin, who we knew was test edge and Christian. They're all in camp. They're all on deck. This is a remarkable time for the company and no disrespect to WCW, because I do know they had great success stories out of the power plant guys like diamond Dallas page and guys like Goldberg and, and what have you. But this man, this is an all-star class in training. Yeah. One of our better classes. I'm noticing that picture that bull Raymond's can put it back up there. You see Pat Patterson in there. Yep. When you got guys like Patterson and Dory jr. Uh, these kids are getting a PhD like education. We had no doubts that uh, many of them in this class had the physical abilities to succeed. The key was how are they going to, uh, how are they going to be socially? Are they going to be good locker room guys? They're going to be good travelers. And more importantly, perhaps is the fact that, uh, are they going to be able to process all this, the in-ring psychology that is required to get over. And so, uh, we were, we were very happy with that class. And, and as you mentioned, the, na the names, they all had different levels of success. And, uh, so I was really proud of that group. It was, it was second only to our class. We had in OVW with, uh, uh, Brock and Cena and Batista and Orton and Shelton Benjamin. That was another pretty good class. So, uh, we were trying to rebuild the foundation of, uh, the talent roster. And I thought that our, our crew, you know, Tom Pritchard and, uh, of course, Jerry Briscoe, uh, I think Tommy dreamer had a lot to do with that. Uh, we had good people making, helping make decisions. They would bring me information. They would bring me their, their pitch. Why should we go ahead and sign this dude? And, uh, so we had a good staff and I'm not going to take, I can't take credit for what the staff did. They did a great job working within our, my department. And, uh, I'll always be grateful for their cooperation and their expertise. That's what you got to have. Well, what else you got to have is bigger buildings to run. You know, you guys are booking buildings well in advance. Who would have known you'd be as hot as you are, but the go home raw from is from Philadelphia. And we're, we're running shows over the weekend in Scranton at the CYC. <laughs> it's a 300, it's a 3,800 seater. Like we could have sold 20,000 tickets, but yeah. we didn't uh, timing timing Conrad. You didn't know yeah. if you had a magic wand or, or crystal ball, obviously you'd have booked a bigger building. These buildings are booked like sometimes a year in advance. It's just hard. You know, Ed Cohen, the late Ed Cohen was a guru in that area. Uh, tremendous, uh, uh, guy that booked our arenas. I miss Ed. He's a, we used to have some real battles. 
uh, over things just like we're talking about. But I understood his position as well. And I respected Ed Cohen and he understood that we could still argue. We still butt heads, uh, because I was getting my ass chewed by the, by the, the head honcho. Uh, and so I knew where my marching orders were. And, uh, so we need to pay attention more to our capacities and, uh, and take advantage of the fact that we're hot right now. And whatever we do is going to sell tickets. We had Austin. We had McMahon. We had TV was strong. So, uh, more often than not. So anyway, uh, it was a fun, it was a fun time. It was a fun time to be in, as you said earlier, and I said it many times, it was a good time to be in the wrestling business. A lot, awful lot of fun. We're going to start this go home episode of raw with Kane and undertaker coming out together. Vince comes out and says, well, that proves you're in cahoots. Paul bear comes out. He's upset. He thought he had Kane in his corner. And now he's furious that the undertaker has turned his son away from him. Cause remember he's his daddy and he goes out of his way to say, Kane and undertaker, your mother was a whore. God. <laughs> Kane is going to stop undertaker from attacking him. Cause that is his daddy. And then mankind comes out and basically allows them to just beat the snot out of him. <laughs> they hit a tombstone pile driver. He goes out on a stretcher. He's taken into an ambulance. Austin's going to vow to beat him up and take him out before the end of the show. And what we're setting up here on free TV on a Saturday night, because we're preempted is a hell in a cell, a hell in a cell with no build, but still a hell in a cell. Hey, it was hot in June. It'll be hot in August. Doesn't bad, have planning, to be- bad planning, bad planning, Connor. God almighty, the stupid decision. Yeah, it really was. I mean, first of all. How do you top what we saw in Pittsburgh? You, you don't, can't. you can't do it. You, it won't work. So anything you do is going to be seen as substandard. It's not like the original and wrestling fans are not stupid. They, they knew that this, this hell on a cell could not live up to the expectations after seeing the, the match in Pittsburgh with, with Taker and Mick. So I, I, I really was against that, that scenario. Just, it took away some of the specialness of the cell. We're coming back too soon. Uh, we needed a better idea and apparently we didn't have it. Well, we did pull something off. We never thought would happen. Uh, we we've seemingly talked about this for months. Ken Shamrock and Dan Severin did actually meet in a wrestling match. That only went two minutes and 53 seconds and it was with a DQ, but still it happened. And it's a way to go ahead and set up this pay-per-view match where Dan has been training Owen. And, uh, next up we see mankind. He's beating up the ambulance attendants and he's going to escape and he's going to roll himself down to the ring (laughs) on a stretcher. One of the most memorable entrances in the history of wrestling. And then he pulls out a big bag of thumbtacks and he asks, what kind of idiot would go into the hell in a cell knowing they'd get their ass kicked. I am that kind of idiot. And it won't be the first time the people in Philadelphia have seen me get my ass kicked. And then he takes a thumbtack and pushes into, into his own face for good measure. I don't know that we can heap enough praise on Mick Foley here. He is in the backdrop of a storyline. He's not the primary focus. He's not in a hugely heated angle, but he is, as you would say on this program and have for many years now maximizing his minutes. Amen. What a great entrance. What a great performance. What a great promo. What a great spectacle. And it would be easy for a talent to be frustrated and say, well, it's not about me. I'm not involved in this. I'm not getting my hand raised at the end. I'm not a part of this story. I'm just in the backdrop, but I will never forget that entrance or him pushing the thumbtack in, but him sliding down on the stretcher. That's hard. Unbelievable entrance. Yeah. I thought he was going to have a wreck on that deal without yeah. question. Here's the thing. Mick worked the territories and working the territories. Conrad, you find yourself in a situation where every week on the weekly TV show, the one hour, which most people had, uh, you're, you got to give them something different. You got to freshen up your storyline and you got to quote unquote, stay over or get over more. And Mick had that, that drill down. Uh, he made himself, uh, viable in that story that you have talked about him being not the number one priority in it. 
He yeah. made himself a priority. He made himself valuable. And that's the mark of an intelligent, experienced star. And Mick was all those things. Really incredible to see what he was able to pull off without it even being designed for him. And we go from that to X Pac ping and Jeff Jarrett's boots. There you go. More urination, more penis stuff oriented stuff. Hey, look, he wasn't getting over. Yeah. And so why do more? Cause nobody wanted to admit it wasn't getting over. That's the bottom line of that deal. We're even going to pull the curtain back. And of course, X-Pac had a reputation for, um, uh, bathroom stuff backstage, but now we, we can't show one of those. I guess we can simulate another with the ping in the boots. And that leads to new age outlaws beating Southern justice. Uh, Hawk is at ringside doing commentary. He's pretending to be stoned. And he says to Lawler on commentary, this is on TV. Now, remember that time in the mid South Coliseum, when you told me to not sell your pile driver and how it got over. Eventually at the desk, Hawk just collapses and falls asleep. And Jarrett comes out in his socks complaining about X-Pac. And then he starts shaving the head of one of the cameramen. Man, this is, uh, this is rough. I, gimmick I, I, is gimmicky. It's horrible. It's a horrible yeah. gimmick, Conrad. God damn it. We can analyze this son of a bitch to we're both, uh, 10 years older. It yeah. sucked. Yeah. It sucked making fun of somebody's uh, drug addiction and them not getting any help, so to speak. I don't know. I mean, I know that Hawk had plenty of opportunities to get uh, help. You know, if we could rehabilitate him and get him back with animal and reunite the road warriors on when they're straight, but I don't know that because of Hawk's propensity for drugs, how long it had been in his career that he had been straight. And so it's not something like he can just flip a switch and be drug free. It's not, that's not going to get it. He needed help. And, uh, it's been so long ago. I can't remember, but we, we, we did all we could do, but you gotta, it takes two to tango in that regard. You know, it's the the denials of a bitch. It's really a bitch. And I felt so bad for, for, for Hawk, but he brought it on himself. Nobody made him take drugs. Nobody made him get uh, in an altered state. That was him. And we needed to help him get over it but he has to help us facilitate that. And that didn't happen. Next up, this isn't the main event. It's not on the last segment. We've got Kane wrestling mankind and they go to a DQ. I know what you're thinking. Wait, isn't that a hell in a cell? That's right. A DQ and a hell in a cell. Here's how there we go. It. That's Watch also, that also infuriates me. Yes. What the fuck are we thinking about? Seriously? The cell is supposed to keep people out. It has a roof on it. We saw, you know, Mick, uh, Mick history would take her, uh, back in June with, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Pittsburgh. God dang, man. What are we doing to this? What a, what a great structure. I mean, starting with Sean and Taker, there had not been any bad matches in hell in a cell. Oh no. And then all of a sudden we're going to do a match where we have a disqualification clause in it that I don't think was advertised. No. And, uh, it was just, oh man, I was just so disappointed in how he treated the cell and, and, uh, there's gotta be something else. You know, you could have a Texas death match, uh, you know, first got a five falls or there's all kinds of shit you could, we could do. There was different and unique, but, uh, nobody asked me, not that I had all the answers, but I have more answers. The answer would not have been hell in the cell. And certainly if that was the hard, fast decision, we would have had a finish. And not a disqualification, not an open-ended finish. Just didn't make any sense in that structure. They pull out all the stops here. Mankind's going to attack the refs. He's going to slam Kane's head in the door. Taker's going to pull Mankind off the cage from halfway up. He's going to fall through the Spanish announce table. Kane's going to do a Pescado. Kane's really going to destroy him with the steps. Several brutal chair shots. Both of the guys fall into the thumbtacks. There's a choke slam from Kane, a couple of tombstones, two more chair shots, another tombstone, this time on a chair. And then Austin comes from under the ring and attacks Kane. And that gives him the DQ. Here comes the stunner, but the undertaker has now climbed to the top of the cage and he's trying to kick in the top. Like we've seen happen before. 
and save Kane, but McMahon starts to raise the cage. So the undertaker is going higher and higher into the air. Austin's going to hit Kane with another stunner. Kane is bleeding everywhere and undertaker vows to meet Austin later in the show. It's a hot segment. It's crazy. It's only a seven minute and 33 second match. It should have probably been something that we sold like hell for pay-per-view, but instead we did it on TV here. My goodness. Yeah. Well, I know. Well, well, it should have never happened. And I mean, I can't justify what yeah. our decision making on that was, it was knee jerk booking. It was hot shotting all the things you hear about. Eliminate the cell completely. And don't tell me we can't come up with a, something that has a finish whereby, uh, Kane beats mankind in a, in a dog fight, a slobber knocker, if you will see the shirt pro wrestling tees. Never mind. Uh, blatant shameless plug. Uh, and, but we just, and you could have also still come out. They have the match, they take her, or excuse me, mankind and Mick. They got a good story. They had good chemistry. They liked each other. They had good matches. Let's put one of them over like Kane, the yeah. heel, and then have Austin come out from under the ring after the finish goes down and you have a finish instead of having uh, a, a watered down, you know, version of the hell in a cell because that hell in a cell did not follow the previous one. Let's, um, let's talk about what's next. Cause this is not the end of the show. I can't believe that's not the main event. China's in the ring, challenging Rocky. Rocky's going to come out with the nation, except for the injured Godfather. They've got a forklift blocking the door. So DX can't get out of their locker room. Rocky's going to do some great mic work saying he knew China wanted him. And he's going to make comments about her getting down on her knees and, uh, Eventually Owen Hart and Delo hold her down. He acts like he's going to kiss her, but then basically says she's so gross. He'd never kiss her. And he tells Mark Henry to kiss her. And Jesus uh, Christ. What is the, what is the fascination in pro wrestling then now and forever to steal a phrase with everybody exposing their tongue? I don't know. God almighty. It's not hot. It's not cool. And it's not new. Keep your fucking tongue in your mouth for God's sakes. Well, before Sorry. Mark can kiss her, here comes Shawn Michaels out of the crowd. He makes the save and clocks Henry with a hard chair shot. We know eventually this leads to sexual chocolate for Mark Henry. And, uh, this segment is, uh, I guess, to build for this ladder match between Rocky and Hunter. And here's Sean back making the save for DX. And I understand. We had to justify him continuing to get checked. So we found something for him to do. Right. Uh, Val Venus is going to be wrestling Takamichi Noku. It goes to a DQ, but before Val could get the, the pin, triple H shows up and hits them both with a chair. Same story, Conrad. Why couldn't Val beat Taka and well, then I, have the run in? Yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go. Same deal. Same, same result. You get a winner of a guy that you're trying to push in a very questionable creative gimmick so you could still do the getting this win and then one two three and there's hunter so uh, at least you got a winner out of the damn thing instead of that's a right. dq and all that because that's what we're talking we're, so many times we're talking about the show uh, raw going into the pay-per-view so forth SummerSlam. it's always about uh you know a dq it seems like and they're flat somebody's got to get it somewhere along the way that's why we don't do a ton of DQs in AEW. Tony Khan knows that that's not going to make the fans overly overwhelmed. And if we're smart and we've got good people helping work out finishes, then consequently, uh, you can still accomplish all your goals, check all your boxes without having to have a, uh, flat ass, uh, run in DQ, no winner. X-Pac is wrestling gang grail when Jarrett clocks him with a guitar for the DQ. And after that, <laughs> DQ, there you go. Keep, keep it rolling. One. Yeah. Nobody wants to do a job or a bit, here's a, a better said than this. Nobody was asked to do a job. That's right. 
because I think most of those guys are getting these involved in these DQs would have, uh, would have been cool with putting somebody over cause this is a whole lot better presentation, uh, than not, but, uh, God almighty, uh, I don't know how we, I tell you how we stayed hot, Steve Austin, right? Mr. McMahon. That's how we stayed hot. That's what people wanted to see. We just couldn't give it to them in every segment, but it was, uh, we were lucky. We had Austin and McMahon. The greatest baby face and the greatest heel in the attitude era. Those two guys. We, uh, we should mention that after this, uh, interaction with Jeff Jarrett edge comes out and attacks Gangrel after the match, but it seems like Gangrel likes it. And Dave says, it looks like they're doing a takeoff of the Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt vampire movie here. Sean Michaels is going to be out again for commentary. And Meltzer says he is actually out there insinuating that maybe Sean's under the influence. Hmm. McMahon is going to confront the undertaker undertaker choke slams him on his 53rd birthday and Austin attacks undertaker, but Kane attacks Austin and they go off the air after what Meltzer calls a pretty nothing brawl. And Meltzer's going on and on about how Sean is talking about God knows what on commentary. Do you remember Sean? being in a rough way here on commentary with you. I, I really don't. It could have happened. I, if I went back and, and listened to it closely, Conrad, I could give you a more conclusive answer, but to relying on my memory from that many years ago, I can't specifically, uh, pinpoint what we're discussing. Could it, could it have happened? Of course. Uh, did it happen? I can't remember. Uh, just being honest to the folks out there listening, uh, go back and watch the tape. Go back and watch it yourself and you make it a call folks. Cause I, I probably would try to get that done. I just don't know. I don't know. It's been that it's been too long. Uh, and I don't know that Sean would have been so bold. I guess he would have, he's Sean Michaels and, uh, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy with his physical condition. He wasn't happy with a lot of things. And so sometimes unhappiness creates bad decision-making. The run up to SummerSlam, of course, has the ACDC song Highway to Hell. It's one of the first times we had a big mainstream song like this featured. As I understand it, Jim, ACDC is one of Vince's favorite bands. Yep. How many times were you in the car with him when he's driving 100 miles an hour blasting songs like that? Yeah. Yeah. It was all good until he started singing. Oh, goodness. Yeah. But he did drive 100 miles an hour. He liked to tell you that he had great hand and eye coordination. <laughs> And I'll look around the car and it's just me and Vince, Bruce and Pat. Sometimes, uh, uh, they, they retreat and we're riding with, you know, Cowboys there sometimes back in the day. And I found myself being Vince's only passenger. I looked at that as a positive cause I could pitch talents, ideas, things like that. But when you're going hundred miles an hour and uh, you're listening to heavy metal or hard rock or classic rock or whatever the hell you want to call it. Uh, it's a little bit disconcerting, shall we say, but, uh, no, he loved it. And I think there's a story there. I'm not sure Conrad, you may have it in your notes whereby, uh, ACDC was on Saturday night live or something like that. And Vince and some of the guys went to it, the taping and, uh, hung out with those guys. I think that's the right story. So, uh, but in any event, yeah, Vince was a huge ACDC fan and you know, hell in that era, who wasn't, we, uh, we got to talk about Vince's birthday. He's getting choke slammed on his birthday here at 53 years old. And he's probably able to do that because he had the right nutritional platform. And if you're looking for the same, can we recommend AG one? It's less painful than a choke slam from the undertaker. I guarantee that. And it tastes a whole heck of a lot better. My wife knew when she was asking me to try it, that if I was going to do it, it had to taste good because I'll be honest. Hey, uh, you need to take this for your health. I just usually associate with, this is not going to taste good. It does. And man, it, not only that, it supports everything. I mean, it covers all your nutritional bases every day. It supports your whole body. And if you hate taking pills or vitamins, maybe you want better gut health. Maybe you want a boost in energy. Maybe you want a supplement that actually tastes great. Dude, this is it. It's like a nutritional platform that delivers whole body health. And it does that because there's 75 high quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source superfoods. It's going to 
really help with that energy. My wife does it every morning on the way to the gym. Now, obviously you can take a look at me and tell I'm not going to the gym, but I'm super productive at work. I used to have that late afternoon crash, not anymore. I feel like I have better focus and better clarity. My wife thinks she has better energy and strength. No matter what you're looking for, AG1 can help. We trust this product. We've used it for years in my household. And as a matter of fact, AG1 has been helping millions of families since 2010. Think of it as like your all in one nutritional insurance. It's a micro habit that gives you macro results. And if you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and hey, a free one year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. All you got to do is go to drinkag1.com slash JR. That's drinkag1.com slash JR. Drinkag1.com slash JR. Check it out. You'll be glad you did. Here's here's another product, Conrad, that works. Yes. You know, we're so proud of our sponsors. We appreciate their support without question. But it's even better when they, they make a great product that can help everybody in your audience. And AG1 can do that. I was watching football or whatever on TV. You know, I binge watch uh, Chicago PD or SVU, whatever. And there's all, there's AG1 commercials. They're national. And they're national because they're successful. You don't keep advertising on a national basis unless your product works. And AG1 works for everybody. And it's so simple to pull off and to execute. Like Conrad says, it tastes good. So you're not, you're not forcing yourself on something. So it's all good stuff, man. So, uh, I'm really glad that they're with us. I'm glad that we're a part of their team and I hope you guys should check out drink one.com slash JR. You'll be very happy that you did. Oh yeah. Great for your health. And there's nothing more important. Take it from me. Nothing more important than good health. Jim, we're finally here at the show. And I'll be honest, I think it's in the best interest of everyone who loved this era of professional wrestling. Go watch this show start to finish. We're going to cover it, but we're not going to do it justice. And here's why the show got 90.7% thumbs up from the wrestling observer readers. And the observer would say the WWF has often repeated the slogan. Nobody does pay-per-view like the world wrestling federations. It's one of those tired slogans that all major wrestling companies seem to have regarding their own product, but they're occasionally lived up to, and it's usually not very favorable, but this lives up to the hype yeah. and the hype for this show was immense presenting one of the better shows of the year. Meltzer loved it. And so did the fans 655,000 buys on pay-per-view the prior year, which was an incredible show. SummerSlam 97 was Brett versus Undertaker with Sean as the special guest referee. It's also the show where Austin got dumped on his head by Owen Hart. Mm-hmm. That show did 225. So wow. instead of doing 225,000 buys again, like last year, we're up to 655,000. And even think about the month prior, Fully Loaded did 305,000. We're more than doubling it now to 655,000. The company is so hot, it would be really hard for us to be critical of this show. I recommend you watch it. You'll see why they set a record. It's been sold out forever. 19,066 fans here paying $764,000. The third biggest gate for a live wrestling show in North America this year, only behind WrestleMania in Boston and the Hogan Goldberg match at the Georgia dome. Uh, it's, it's just remarkable. By the way, they've also got the theater. There's 2,500 fans in there paying $32,000. They've got $210,000 in merch. And oh, by the way, they're crushing it on Sunday night heat. Shawn Michaels would join you and, and, uh, and Shane McMahon at the desk. Maybe it's not the best job of commentary, but we got a lot of star power here. As we see Brian Christopher and Scott Taylor beat LOD 2000. Uh, This is really just a continuation of that Hawk storyline. We see Gangrel beat Dustin Runnels in two and a half minutes. We also see uh, the Disciples of the Apocalypse beat Bradshaw and Vader. And they're teasing that Vader and Bradshaw aren't getting along from the very start. Uh, And then uh, those are all pieces of business that happened at MSG prior to the pay-per-view. And on that same episode of Heat, we see Shawn Michaels interviewing Sable 
asking her who her mystery partner is. She doesn't answer and she starts dancing. So Sean starts dancing. And then before you know it, Jeff Jarrett and Southern justice come out and they hold down the ring announcer, Howard Finkel. And here on heat, Jeff Jarrett is shaving off what's left of Howard Finkel's hair because it's a hair match later on on the pay-per-view. Uh, Meltzer would say that I don't know what it says about the company loyalty and employee loyalty when they humiliate someone as regularly as they do Finkel, who is kind of the butt of internal jokes, but they're doing it publicly for no other reason than he's so loyal that they can. Here's my question. I hear that. And I've heard that, that they used to rib Howard and, and Vince could be pretty hard on him unmercifully, but it feels like on camera. And I don't know. I wasn't there. Think would have loved this man. Oh, I'm involved in something. That's the deal. He loved it. Yeah. He loved Howard loved being a participant. Yes. Uh, uh, Above and beyond his uh, outstanding work as a ring announcer. Howard was just, uh, he, 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 he was glowing. You know, Howard didn't give a shit about his hair. It didn't hurt his feelings. It made him happy. He, he was on part of the show. Now I'm not saying that I would have had the same, uh, uh, idea or the same mindset if it had been me, cause I wouldn't have done a hair match. They send my ass home. I ain't doing it. Uh, I hate to sound like a turd, but you know, seeing JR with the head shade is not something I'm going to embrace idea wise. Howard loved it. Yeah. Probably one of the happiest days of Howard's career. Seriously, folks, that he got to be a part of an angle and uh, he pulled it off. You know, you felt bad for Howard and, uh, and hopefully it will get a little heat on the heels. That was the idea. Obviously. D Lo Brown is going to be in the opener against Val Venus here on the pay-per-view for the European title. It's a pretty good match. It gets a star in three quarters. It probably went a little too long at 15 minutes and 24 seconds. Uh, but D is really getting this chest protector over the finish leads a little bit to be desired, but we, we keep going. It's Kurgan teaming with Golga and giant Silva to take on, uh, Kai and Ty. This is not good. No. Negative two stars, <laughs> but we've got, uh, we've got the insane clown posse here doing the oddities music entrance live. So it feels like it's a, a cool moment, but boy, it is not good wrestling, but we make up for it in our third match. It's X-Pac and Jeff Jarrett in a hair versus hair match. They go 11 minutes and 11 seconds. Howard Finkel's back out sans mustache with a freshly shaved head. And he's wearing a DX shirt and a bow tie. Uh, this is really fun. The match was fun after the match. Of course, after X-Pac wins, they're using scissors to cut his hair, but they don't get all of his hair. We're going to see, uh, Jeff show up with a cooler haircut on the other side. And as we recently learned that just pissed Bruce Pritchard off royally thinking, Damn it. If it's a hair match, yep. shave his head. Don't make him look cooler with a better haircut. what do you think about this hair versus hair, but maybe not an embarrassing haircut at the I, end. I agree with Brucey. You're going to advertise. It's like, don't, 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 uh, downgrade a step, especially one that had in, in years past would have been a main event with somebody getting their head shaved, but Jeff, but Jeff didn't get his head shaved. He got a nice haircut and I'm with Bruce on this one. We, we let the fans down because they were used to seeing someone actually get their head shaved like Vince did at, uh, WrestleMania 23 with the Donald Trump business. Vince did it. He didn't get a nice haircut. He got his head shaved. So, uh, that's what we should have done there with this one. It's just, you know, I don't know that Jeff wanted to commit to a bald head. I don't know. Uh, probably not. If he didn't have to, he's not going to do it. But I'm with Bruce on this one, 100%. He, we, we let the fans down with this uh, tried and true stipulation that we raped and pillaged. Next up, we've got Sable and Edge taking on Mark Mero and Jacqueline in eight minutes and 26 seconds. So the big mystery is Edge. Unfortunately, there's no pop because Edge is still new. Edge is not Edge yet. But it is a big moment for him on a huge pay per view star and a half and he comes out on the winning side sable is over like rover yeah 
Uh, now it's time for the match in the theater. It's Ken Shamrock and Owen Hart in a lion's den match. They go nine minutes and 16 seconds. They built a very small structure with a nine foot high cage. It's similar to an octagon, but not exactly. So we can't get in trouble, but it's a, a much smaller fighting area. Mm -hmm. and uh it's interesting i mean i don't know what to say it's not what you would normally expect but they made the most out of it i thought they pulled it off yeah it felt believable enough at least it's three and a half stars and uh ken shamrock gets the win as he should in a lion's den match what do you think of of this presentation and if nothing else it proves man owen hart could do pretty much anything couldn't he he was amazing just simply amazing i'm so happy that aew is uh honoring his memory in a variety of ways through the Owen Hart foundation. I love the fact that we're getting involved in things like that. Uh, Dr. Martha Hart is a, a super lady raising a great family. Uh, it, it, it warms my heart every time I see her and the kids. Uh, but Owen is just, I don't know that he's still to this very day. People realize how great he was. Absolutely. How great he was. He made that, uh, match in a theater with Kenny, uh, work and not that Kenny didn't do his share. He obviously did, but, uh, it was a good finish, good presentation. And I thought those guys deserve a huge attaboy. And I hope that we gave them a great payoff. At least that's, you know, you always hope I don't remember what it was, but, uh, they deserved a good, good payday. And I think they got it. What winds up being a handicap match is the new age outlaws regaining the tag titles for mankind. Yeah. Handicap match, but man, the crowd is so with it. The outlaws are so over, uh, and the psychology is well, a little less than because it's a handicap match. It only goes five minutes and 16 seconds. Uh, they do show Kane swinging a hammer. You never actually see mankind taking the shots, but it's all happening inside the dumpster. So Kane just putting an end to mankind here, one star. And now it's time for some real wrestling, man. You want to talk about a great ladder match, maybe a forgotten one, maybe one that people don't talk about enough because it is a different style ladder match. And imagine just for a minute, if you're these guys, triple H and the rock. Everybody's talking about these guys as if they're one of these guys is going to be the next big thing. Is it going to be the leader of the nation who's reinvented himself after being pushed down our throats and we hated it? Is it going to be the guy who got punished after the whole Madison square garden curtain call thing? And then he took over DX. He's the leader of DX, but these are some big shoes to fill. It's not just a ladder match. It's a ladder match in Madison square garden. These same fans saw Shawn Michaels and razor Ramon reinvent what people thought was possible. I mean, a lot of times that was their first ladder match they'd ever seen. And now we've got to follow that. And Eric Bischoff often says on his podcast, you can't be, you know, better than less than, or different than you got to pick one of those. And they probably thought, man, there's no way we can be better than that match. And we don't want to be less than that legendary razor Sean match. Let's be different than, and this is a totally different style. This is less high flying, less high spots, more brutality. They're using the ladder as a weapon, right? And it is a remarkable match. They get plenty of time, 26 minutes and one second. It's not nearly as spectacular as the Sean Michaels ladder bombs, but it is brutal and Meltzer loved it. He gave it four and a quarter stars. Um, Triple H is going to wind up being blinded thanks to some powder from Mark Henry. China is going to give Rocky a low blow. Triple H gets the belt. Triple H gets the win. And you could see that even though the rock is a heel, he's won over the crowd. Yeah. And, and I've heard you say before, sometimes on the program, Mr. Ross, that it's not always who goes over. It's who gets over. Correct. Triple H went over, but perhaps Rocky Maivia got over. This is a special match. What do you remember? I loved it. I loved it. It was, uh, worth, it was worth uh, every star that Meltzer presented in his, uh, judging system. Absolutely amazing. And one of the reasons it was amazing is because it was a different spin 
on an established gimmick. It was a different presentation. Uh, you know, Hunter and, and rock Wayne had a, they had a, uh, they had a plan. They wanted it to be different and they, and they succeeded. I love that match. It was, uh, it helped make that pay-per-view without, without question. I don't know that there's anything on the card. that was that much better if at all. No, that, that ladder match. It was just tremendous. This is a time where the company's so hot. I remember this vividly. You guys went straight to the home shopping network right after and sold. There's no telling how many millions of dollars worth of merch. And it was all on the heels of this event. And a lot of that is because of the main event. It's coming up next. It's stone cold retaining his WWF title against the undertaker in 20 minutes and 52 seconds. By this point, stone cold, I believe has his smoking skull championship with him. The undertaker is saying Kane is not going to interfere in the match. I'm going to win the title and I'm going to win it on my own. A great effort and a very good match. According to Meltzer, something happens early on though. And accidents happen. The guys bump heads, they collide. And you can tell Austin's shaking up pretty big here. Probably got and concussed, probably got concussed Conrad, to be honest with you, but he's not the kind of guy that's going to raise his hand that I'm hurt. So let's remind everybody, the undertaker's working with a bad ankle so bad. He can barely walk. Right. And just a few minutes into the match where Austin knows I'm going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting here. Cause my, my partner here, he's having trouble moving around. He gets knocked for a loop. As they used to say back in the day, he's on queer street. He's like, wait, what's <laughs> going on? Where am I? What's go- What's happening? And then we start to see him bleeding from the mouth and coughing up blood. There's no blood capsule here, folks. These folks were really beating the shit out of each other. They were, it is a, it is uh, a heck of a match. I think you should go out of your way to see it, especially when you realize this is a baby face versus a baby face. I mean, that's not something we saw all the time. And how about that big leg drop? On the Spanish announce table, my goodness, we're seeing them pull out all the stops. Uh, the match got three and a half stars, but afterwards, instead of there being some brouhaha undertaker grabs the title belt, teases, he's going to hit Austin with it and just hands it to him. A lot of people didn't think this would work because they weren't as heavy on story. They needed a hot issue, a baby face versus a heel. It was a baby face versus baby face. And unlike WrestleMania 12, where buys were down, unlike WrestleMania six, where buys were down, buys were up way up. And a lot of that is because of stone cold, Steve Austin. What a special show, man. what do you think of that main event and the performance by these guys who really had a, the deck stacked against them? Well, those two guys have admitted in, uh, in uh, at various places, you know, as much as they loved each other as competitors, pro wrestlers. Uh, they didn't have the greatest chemistry with each other and that's just how it works sometimes. So they had to work especially hard to make this thing work, especially when you factor in the fact that undertaker is the only guy that I know that would attempt to have a great match on a, on a, on one wheel, one legged man in an ass kicking contest is what comes to mind. Uh, but I thought that they pulled it off. I was overly impressed again, considering I knew how severe Taker's ankle was how severely injured it was, how much it limited his mobility and how he had to, uh, withstand the amazing pain that he was in and he pulled it off. So I, I, I have great respect for both those guys still do to this very day are two of my favorite people that I ever worked with. And, uh, somehow or another, uh, they reached down into their gut and came up with a winner. If we're going to recommend one match to watch, go out of your way to watch the ladder match. Uh, it's the day these guys both became stars, Hunter and the rock. They did it in the garden, which of course is super important to Vince and the WWE. Right. And it's an all time ladder match because it's different than correct. Um, I really enjoyed this show just because I was at my peak fandom and it felt like you guys could do no wrong. The audience was really one of the other stars of the show. Everything was so hot. Everybody was so excited. We could forgive some less than awesome wrestling. I mean, if you watch this show with the sound off, it's not the same. Uh, thank, but thank you, Conrad. <laughs> yeah. My, my goodness. If you can see the enthusiasm with this fan base 
or Stone Cold and The Undertaker and The Rock and Triple H, you know they got something special. And it set all kinds of records. Uh, in the ring, maybe it doesn't hold up as much, but my goodness, what a special show. What a special time for the business. Uh, any final words on, uh, on SummerSlam 1998 today? It, 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 cl it closed the way it, sh it needed to close. It closed with the ladder match and the title match. And both those matches with four hall of fame guys in it, uh, certainly, uh, delivered, it certainly delivered. So I, I was pleasantly surprised at uh, how well it ended. They'd seen all kinds of crazy shit. The fans meeting, they, uh, just had seen all kinds of stuff of the kind ties and the, this, that, and the other Val and whatever, but, uh, we, we close it with wrestling and great wrestling with four guys that, uh, will be considered long after Conrad, you and I are gone as for the best who ever wrestle in a pro in a pro wrestling match. The timing was perfect and they did a great job. I was so proud of all those guys. Well said. Next week, we'll be back talking about another SummerSlam, this time from 20 years ago. We'll go fast forward from today's show to 2003. It's an elimination chamber with Kevin Nash, Randy Orton, Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, Triple H, and Goldberg. Of course, we've got uh, Kane and Rob Van Dam. How about Eric Bischoff versus Shane McMahon, Kurt Angle versus Brock Lesnar, and so much more. You get all these shows early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. As a matter of fact, you can even be a part of our live studio audience. And I want to give a shout out to everybody who showed up and hung out with us today. By the way, not only do you get all of our podcasts on our network, starting at just $9 a month early and ad free, you can also sign up for a ton of bonus content, not just bonus content from every single show here on the network, but exclusive new series like the insiders with, with me. Uh, I actually just sat down with Dan Bynum to talk about his creations over in world-class championship wrestling, the production side of professional wrestling and how he and Keith Mitchell really changed the game there. We also sit down and, and break down the book, those fabulous booking sheets from Jim Crockett promotions in 1985 from JJ Dillon's handwriting from the genius mind of dusty Rhodes. David Crockett breaks down show by show, gate by gate, day by day. We've also got an ask Conrad series Monday mailbags with the third man in the ring. You get to pick the brains of both Mike Kyoto from the WWF side of things and Nick Patrick from the WCW side of things. And how about this? A brand new series Tuesdays with the taskmaster. Kevin Sullivan is exclusive to adfreeshows.com. You don't want to miss it. That's adfreeshows.com. By the way, if your business is targeting men that are 25 to 54 years old, there's no better place to advertise than right here with us on grilling JR. You've heard us do some ads for some of the same companies for years. Why is that? Well, because it really works. And with our super targeted audience, there's very little waste. Go right now to advertise with jr.com to find out more about advertising here on grilling JR. Also want to mention that we'd love to have your interaction. If you've got a question for us about next week's show or anything, you can ask it at JR grilling on Twitter or Instagram. It's grilling JR over on Facebook. The easiest and best way to support the show is to check us out on YouTube. That's grilling JR on youtube.com. And of course, we've got lots of fun swag for you over at grillingjrts.com. But how about this, man? It's grilling season, baby. I used some all-purpose seasoning last night. My steak has never tasted better. And that's because of JR and jrsbbq.com. What else you got going on over there today, dude? Well, we got a lot of good things. We got a lot of signed uh, items. And I signed a bunch of those action figures, which is pretty cool. And, uh, we got trading cards, classic trading cards and good food. You know, our red S, uh, JR's red S hot sauce is finding its way. People are discovering it and buying another bottle or they're getting another bottle for a buddy. And I think all of our products are certainly worthy of gifting and keeping stocked. So uh, JR's BBQ.com is where you go and, uh, we'll do our best to take care of you. If we don't, you got to let us know. And we'll fix it. It's really simple. You can order today. You can order tomorrow. You can order anytime you want. Cause the store never closes. We're always there for you. And, uh, Steven link who runs that site is happy to take care of any issues that you may have, uh, uh on, uh, our, in our, in our situation, you can't control the shipping, but we could damn sure make an attempt to make it as good as possible. So, uh, check it out. Sauces, gift items. 
it's just, uh, and as Conrad says, it is grilling season. Now for guys like he and I, it's always grilling season. So, uh, I'm going, they're getting ready to finish my, or start my process on my, uh, put replacing all the windows in my building, which uh, was a huge financial assessment to all of the folks that live here. And, uh, I think they're going to start on my uh, place next week, which means I'm going to be relocating to Oklahoma for a couple of weeks while they're here working. I've hired three very efficient ladies to my original, uh, uh, project manager that did all the re, re uh, decorating here. Conrad has been in my place. Uh, and then my housekeeper and, uh, uh, and, and our board member who lives next door to me. So I'm lucky there. So I'll be doing, being in Oklahoma for a few days. Can't wait to do that. I just wish it was football season for real. So I'd go to a game on there, but nonetheless, uh, things are busy around this joint. And, uh, again, we appreciate your business on JR's barbecue.com. It, it's a, a great honor and a privilege to serve your family with my family's recipes. I hope you'll check them out. Absolutely. We appreciate you guys support. Thank you for listening. Hope you'll share and tell everybody about your new favorite podcast, grilling JR and be sure to catch, uh, our old pal, Jim Ross this Saturday night in collision. I can't believe this is real, man. He's still behind the mic, still doing this <laughs> thing. It's live. You never know what's going to happen. Collision is such a fun show. Go out of your way to see it. And man, they're really rolling out the red carpet for you, Jim. I love getting to see your entrance on TV. That was pretty cool. I didn't know that was going to happen. That was a Tony Khan surprise. He said after the show, I didn't even know I was on, I, I wasn't aware of it. Wow. Now, it was cool. And I appreciate it. Don't get me wrong. Us, all of us old ego maniacs and no talents, uh, love to get that TV time, that face time. Uh, that was a Tony Khan idea. And I really appreciate his kindness. And also Conrad, just one last mention. If you're going to be in the, in the New Jersey area, uh, there you see it, uh, Russell bash. I hope you'll come out. There's a lot of great talent there. A lot of great folks I'm looking forward to seeing and, and, and hugging and shaking hands with and so forth. Uh, but it's a, I, I think I go on at 11 AM Sunday morning after flying in from uh, Lexington. And if they say you can't get there from here, bullshit, you can't, you just got to leave at 5 AM. So it'll be a fun day, long day, but I'm looking forward to seeing all the fans there and hope you'll come out and, and join us and uh, have some fun little fellowship, shoot the breeze. I enjoyed talking to all the fans. It's a lot of fun because you find out what they're thinking. You find out what's hot because that's the best research from the paying customer. So we're looking forward to Sunday. Hope you guys will join us if you can. We'll see you guys next week, right here on grilling Jr. with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross, eat more barbecue. It's good for you. Hey guys, Tony Schiavone. Need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. Conrad sits down with a pioneer of wrestling television production, director Dan Bynum, who discusses his journey through WCW, ROH, MLW, and where it all began for him, world class. What really was the uh the thing that that catapulted it was one working with rick flair he came to the territory and wrestled with the von eric boys and gave us so much uh gravitas and two the greatest feud in the history of wrestling the Freebird von eric feud mm -hmm. uh so we were there at the hottest time with the hottest show and we took over the world the Yeti, Ron Reese, sits down with Ad Free Shows members to talk about his infamous night at Halloween Havoc and how it was received by the boys in the back. Oh, no, I rip. remember, like, Arn Anderson told me that that was the drizzling shits and Dusty Rose is like, that was the worst thing I've ever seen. And I'm just like, hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you. With four levels to choose from, see for yourself. Why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com.